All right. Looks like we're projecting. I'm going to move this to where it mostly faces you. Okay. And it's on you, hopefully, most of the time now. And I will need you to take this microphone and keep it near you. And I'm going to gap down this tape so people don't pull the projector and everything else off because I know people look busy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mic two. All right. I'm a square. How far can I go? Is this cool? No. Back it off. If this isn't cool, how can you see the screen? I'm recording the screen back. Oh, that's right. Okay. Cool. Never mind. How's the audio? How's, how's the levels on that? I knew. Okay. <coughs> now I'll leave it. It'll be the most watched talk. Did you see that guy that wore a Johnny trip and broke his face open? Should watch his talk. It's amazing. Yeah. Anyway, you Okay. Yeah. Okay. So as these, as you guys can tell, I do a lot. Um, this is this isn't a joke. These are the badges for what I'm responsible for at this conference. Uh, here, I am uh, the director of uh, entertainment, which sounds like kind of a BS job. Um, well, really, like I thought it might be. It was like, yeah, you know what? I got, I got a couple of free cycles. I can coordinate some entertainment for you, and then it ended up being like literally a full-time, insanity-inducing job, um, just working with agents and contracts, and haggling in an incredibly unprofessional industry. Uh, it was rough. Um, there, I mean, there were there was some talent I didn't book purely based on the unprofessionalness of their agent. Um, which is unfortunate, but it was like, I, I, I don't have time for this. I have to, if, if I had nothing going on, maybe I'd mess around with this, but, um, we did get MC Front a lot for you guys tonight. I don't know if any of you are fans of his. Um, his work is excellent, just absolutely excellent. One of the, the, uh, most well produced, well rehearsed nerdcore rappers around, hands down. I highly recommend you guys check him out tonight. Uh, the reason, my voice is so messed up is because this is my second con of the week. <laughs> uh, I was at uh, Show Me Con in St. Louis. Uh, I got there about Sunday um, and was, effectively speaking, for three days straight, <laughs> whether it was up here or uh, <clears throat> two actual people. And then Thursday, Adrian and I came on, drove, drove up from St. Louis. That's Adrian in the back. Uh, to here, to do it all again. And I'm doing, uh, this training session and speaking later today. This play setting is just fascinating. What's that? This play setting is just fascinating. Oh, yeah. I do. <laughs> this is, so we're gonna talk about, uh, display settings today. <laughs> <laughs> now I'll, I'll set that up. I'm gonna use, uh, here's an old slide. That should be fine. Yeah. Um, so uh, my talk later today is on, it's, it's more of a, a fun when I was your age rant. Um, I thought it'd be cool because we've got two main generations here. We've got all of us and then we've got all of our kids uh, next door. And so I'm talking about what technology was like in 1993 before ubiquitous internet, before GPS, before cell phones. <clears throat> so nothing, nothing to do with getting a job, but in, which I thought was great. I'm like, this will be easy. And that's, that wasn't easy either. Um, it was really fun <laughs> that was setting up, but he ended up, he ended up with six pages of just notes of this when I, when I was your age, get off my lawn rant. And you go, Oh man, they only give me an hour. <laughs> the 1993, mm -hmm. the 1993 BC before cell phones. What time was that? I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, I think it's like five o'clock or four o'clock or something. I think they stuck me near dinner time, and I'm like, I think, I think it's in the middle of me drinking. So <laughs> this is in the middle of me drinking. Um, so uh, here's how this is going to work. Um, 
it's wordy. It's all me talking. There's very little workshops because the workshops are really going to be you guys back out there trying the things you learn in here. Um, this is, this, and it's not as boring as I'm going to make it sound, but it's going to be note, note heavy. Um, you're going to want to get out some notes. I realize some people are more laptop, some people are more pen and paper. I'm a pen and paper guy. Uh, so whatever you want to bust out to take notes on, um, or don't take notes, that's your call. I won't be offended. <clears throat> but there's a, there's a lot of information that I've crammed into what for me is a small amount of time, and so I'm really going to just push through a lot of stuff. If you got a question anytime, uh, throw a hand up. I'm cool. Interrupt me. I want to, we're all taking a lot of time out for this. I want to make sure that I address everything you guys have because you bothered to uh, get up way too early to come and do this. Um, who was, who was at the, the party last night? Anyone check it out? Cool. What'd you guys think? Yeah. Yeah, how about that? That was that was the one thing I did where I, where I had no anxiety about. It. I was like, "This is gonna work." Get these arcade games in here, line the walls. Yeah, um, unfortunately, as uh, as the entertainment coordinator, I got to stay in that party until the end, and that was about two thirty, three a.m. And then they made me teach a class at night. <laughs> um, yeah, how about ten a.m. Right? I'll, yeah, I'm gonna put that in the survey. How about 10 a.m.? Uh, so uh, it, it's going to be a lot of me talking. Um, who's, see, who's seen my talks before? You watched them all? Okay. All right. Everything back to like 2002? No, I thought Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to go through this one again. Uh, the, this class is going to be a combination of a form of two talks I've already done, but I've expanded on them. Uh, added, removed information. The first part is going to be skills-based. Um, what what you need to have skills-wise to be able to not only talk your way into an interview, but uh, talk your way through an interview and get your foot in the door. Uh, and that's this whole thing is getting your foot in your door. Getting your foot in the door. It's that... It's that I really want a job in InfoSec. Maybe I'm coming from IT. Maybe I'm coming from somewhere completely different. Uh, and I really have this passion for it. But I'm all over the map with skills and with experience. And uh, I'm not very good at networking. And so we're going to teach you how to, how to have a focus, how to kind of focus that laser and hone in on what's really, really important at the base level. Um, so that somebody can see, A, this person not only has a passion for this, but B, um, is, is actually not going to be a huge pain for me to hire uh, to get in here and actually get trained. I'm going to close this door in the back. It says people wake up. I suspect this is going to get awful. <clears throat> um, it's also a possibility that it's going to get hot in here. Can we close these anymore? It looks like, are there, no, that's, that's not, not hooked up to anything. I believe there's, it looks like there's stoppers here. Am I wrong? Oh. Yeah, it's just, I don't know. Wow. <laughs> is there a cord? Oh, there is a cord. Here it is. All right. There we go. I got it. Oh, watch out. Should at least keep the temperature down. I hope. And we'll do breaks and stuff. I'll let you guys walk around and wake up. Um, <clears throat> so the first part is heavily skills based. Um, it may be skills some of you have. It may be skills some of you didn't even have a desire for. But uh, whether you're trying to get into either, you know, blue team, red team, uh, information security engineering, or uh, really more of a GRC role or an auditing role, um, I find that the skills we're going to discuss in the first part are critical to all of those because it gives you a base understanding of exactly what is going on in the information security department uh, with the team as a whole. 
Uh, so even if you're not trying to be, you know, an analyst, you're not trying to catch malware, um, it's still critical, really important for you to understand what's going on at that level and at least have some tiny bit of skill and ability to do it or at least take a good crack at it. Um, I, in my experience, have run into too many auditors and too many GRC people who have uh, no technical skill set. And um, it's, it's really difficult to work with them, especially uh, directly on a team, uh, because you have to take what you're talking about to such a high level sometimes that you, you're no longer conveying pertinent information about what's going on. And uh, overall, that's just dangerous to a company. Uh, and so even like regardless of what position in InfoSec you're trying to get, it's important to have at least a base level of skills or have had those skills at some point uh, so you really understand what everyone's doing. Uh, the second half, uh, second part of the talk uh, is going to be on networking, uh, human networking, um, what you should be doing here, the going outside, the making new friends, the talking to people, uh, the working with people in your industry, the very human face-to-face -face aspect of it, because um, that's actually a really, really, really important part of it, possibly the most important, uh, I personally argue the most important part of all of it, <clears throat> because you can teach anyone skills. Um, if somebody doesn't know something, you can teach them, they can learn. That's how we work as human beings. Um, but you can't, anyway, I'll get into that later. <laughs> um, and, and the third part, and it'll be, the third part will be shorter, and we're just going to talk about uh, basically what your resume should look like, um, resume building in general. I'll do some good examples, some bad examples uh, that, that maybe we may only spend a half hour or so on. Um, it's a lot of, because resumes are really easy, and people overthink them. They put way too much effort into making a resume because they think that their resume is what's being interviewed. Their resume is what's going to make or break their ability to get that job, and it's absolutely uh, patently untrue. Not at all. <clears throat> um, a little bit about myself professionally. I am a, uh, currently I'm a penetration tester for a company called Red Leg. You may have seen our booth uh, upstairs. Uh, you may have seen that we're sponsors for the party. It's actually totally coincidental uh, <laughs> that my company is the sponsor for the party that I put together. Um, that's just how it happened. I actually have nothing to do with sponsorship at my company. Um, however, the owners of my company showed up and they brought a bunch of their kids and they're doing Hack for Kids, which is really cool. Um, I uh, started off, like I think a lot, if not all of you did, um, doing maybe building computers. I was working working retail, um, and then kind of finagled my way into an IT job from there, and uh, worked my way up. I actually went to school for chemistry, <laughs> and found IT to be more lucrative, and kept going down that path. Um, but a lot of how I got to where I got to was done not so much by building up experience and skills. And I'll get into a little bit a bit more about my serious background uh, in the middle to show you guys that it's not my skills that got me where I am. Um, it's, it, was, it was my networking. It was my ability to kind of job hop based on who I knew, uh, not so much what I knew. Hey, we got some room. You can come on in. I don't know if you registered or not. Um, yeah, it looks like maybe 15% of the people didn't show. Which is nice. It'll keep it, it'll keep it going. Hey, thanks for coming. <laughs> that guy knows me. <clears throat> so, who here um, is working IT currently? Just any, any kind of IT role? Yeah. <laughs> um, who didn't raise their hand? What? Yeah. What? You. What? Are, what are you doing now? If you don't mind saying, you don't have to. <laughs> Okay. And, uh, used to work in military intelligence and stuff like that, and kind of was in the infosec track. 
and correlate them a little bit. Maybe. That's a cool idea. Yeah. Good. I work with my job. I do art for Okay. Right. Okay. So IT in the name, but you're on the business side. Yeah. <laughs> and and not to pick on them because I've also come across some some really knowledgeable uh or just with it GRC people and, but a lot of times because they moved up from hard infosec into GRC um and then got really good with business and they kind of put it all together GRC's hard and, and auditing's hard um because you really got to know a little Unfortunately we had a little video snafu here but it should start back up around the 37 minute mark.
Right. Well, there's a lot of shortcuts in Perl, and everybody uses the shortcuts, and the shortcuts look like your cat walked across the keyboard. Um, right. And, and, and it makes for tiny scripts, which is what you always want. Um, for, then, if you need a quick tool that's going to do a quick thing, and a lot of the stuff that you need to do that already exists, and you need just to put all those things together in one place and make them all do it, um, scripting is where you want to be. Uh, and for scripting, uh, I highly recommend Python. Uh, it's easier to learn. It's easier to get into. Um, it's very human readable. It's incredibly powerful. Um, Python is is the thing now um, where back in the like back in the day, the thing to do would be if a new piece of new electronic device came out, would be the cool thing was to see if you could get Linux to run on it. And we used to do these with like MP3 <laughs> players back in like the late '90s. Creative would put out a MP3 player and go, "Oh man, I bet I can get that to run Linux because it's got a USB port." And we break in through the firmware, dump the firmware, put a shell in it, upload it back on, <clears throat> and then you go, here, here's, look at my screen, here's proof Linux is running on my MP3 player, even though with the MP3 player itself, you have no way of really doing anything with Linux, and like, why would you do that? And it was like, oh, I could put it on my blender, uh, but it was just, it was, that was like the thing to do. And... Um, Python is now, people are making modules for Python that do all kinds of stuff because it's easy to write for. So they're going, I wonder if I can make a module in Python that would take this and then output that and do it this way. And like making it do all kinds of really weird backflips. Um, just funny in its own right, but uh, a testament to how powerful it is and how, and, and a testament to how ubiquitous it is or should be. Um, it can do most, most anything. For you know, for as far as a, a daily tool goes, so I highly recommend learning Python, regardless. But if you want to get more into the malware reversing, malware creation side of things, um, learning a legitimate language like C is the way to go. Um, and to answer your question about what do I do with Python, outside of just do Python activities and go, okay, cool, I learned it. Now what? Um, like I was saying, think of something for it to do. Think of uh, a tool that you would like to have. Like if there's some irritating task you got to do in your computer a lot that maybe takes a lot of pointing and clicking, figure out how to write a Python script that would do that for you. And you could just type, type you know, activity.py, and it just will take care of it all in the back end. So what's really cool about that is it's not also teaching you Python. It's really teaching you the back end of the operating system and how to do a lot of things from the command line. Um, and command line is critical regardless of your operating system. Um, it's, it's especially critical in Windows. Um, nobody knows Windows command line because of the nature of how Windows works. Um, Windows, more or less, has uh, a pretty far powerful command line. Uh, and now with the advent of PowerShell and PowerShell being in every modern version of Windows, um, it's got an amazing scripting language built into it. So, yeah, so there's another one, PowerShell. Um, highly recommend you learn PowerShell uh, as a great scripting language, especially if you're generally a Windows user. If you run Windows on your primary system, um, if you're one of those guys, there's nothing wrong with it. We need Windows people, but we need serious, hardcore Windows people, people who know the guts of Windows like nobody else because there aren't many of those. Um, so... It maybe if your hang up is man, I don't I don't really know Linux, like and I can't figure out how to learn Linux. Um I don't, a, it's not I don't know what you're doing, it's not that hard. <laughs> um I, I if I find Linux to be easier than Windows to learn exactly how everything works because it's so open. Um right, it's more logically structured. Um you can really kind of intuitively make your way, figure things out on your own, whereas Windows is like I don't know. Uh, you got to find some knowledge base article from Microsoft from eight years ago, and you go, I, "Oh, here's how they did it." It it still makes no sense how they did it or why they did it this way, and thus it's really hard to commit that to memory because it doesn't make any sense, uh, and it's because it's eighty guys worth of code all put together and kind of cobbled, and that's what you have to deal with. Um, yeah. I'm taking my notes out here. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, keep talking, buddy. <laughs>
try like Code Academy, Euphemia, Plus Engineering. Either you have a really monotone person top in the class that kind of forces you to that. I hate those. And I'm sorry if I sound like that. It's just my voice is gone. If you guys have seen my videos, you know I'm usually more boisterous. <laughs> Right. Right. Whereas the stack is exactly what you need to learn about. Yeah. You need to know how it works and why you're why you're screwing around in it, <laughs> and what else you can screw with in the stack. Uh, the stack. <laughs> yeah. Write that down. Learn about the stack. The stack is a critical part of information security. I'm not going to get into it. That's your that's your fun, you guys. <laughs> on the side, the stack. <laughs> I'm going to start using that as just like a term. <laughs> The stack. Yeah. Dude, that's all in the stack. <laughs> all right. So, um, uh, also, if you have something, a, a tool that exists already that, that seems pretty basic and it's like, and you're like, oh, I just use it, you know, I just only use this program to just do this one thing because it takes this in and outputs that really well. Um, write it in Python. Take something that already exists. And write it in Python from scratch in your head. Um, that's what I do. I take tools that I, I, I'll take tools I made in something else, and go. Oh, I'm going to try and make a Python version of that. Uh, and then once you're really good at writing stuff in Python, and you want to learn something else like Perl, you go. I'm going to take these things I wrote in Python, and I'm going to remake. And I'm going to reinvent the wheel in Perl. And you go. Well, why? You already have something that's because I'm trying to learn Perl. Like the, <laughs> for the pure aspect of just teaching it yourself. And what you're going to find once you start doing that is you go. Oh, Perl's really way better for this and that and this other thing, uh, as opposed to Python. Like, yeah, you can do it in Python, but man, I could do it an in, in eighth of the time in Perl, and vice versa. And so it's, you know, that, and that'll really help you learn a lot of, not only a lot of languages in general, but what's best for what, what to use in what situation, and any carpenter or craftsman will tell you, use the right tool for the right situation, and you get the job done a lot better, a lot more solidly and stably. Um, but, for the purposes of getting like that first introductory job, being pretty good with one scripting language is like the the that's like the least the like the least thing you have to do. Um, most people aren't uh, incredible at a low level language, so especially these days. Go ahead. Is that scripting yeah, yeah. Bash scripting. I mean, it's certainly not Python, and it's um, not as powerful as Python. Um, but yeah, if you're great at bash scripting and automation, that's absolutely critical, especially in the engineering side. Um, we don't we we don't see those guys either coming in. We see guys who know their way around Linux um, in general Linux administration, like a base level administration, but like they're no good at bash scripting. Um, and bash is the to make to give you the short version, Bash is the the command line the command line on Linux, and so as far as, so you can tell for automation purposes, knowing how to run write a lot of scripts that are run on the command line to do a lot of things for you is absolutely critical. Uh, you have a question? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, how, no, and, well, no, and answer the question how those skills translate. Um, you learn the structure of how computer programming lurks, works. You learn an objective language, um, which is fantastic. You understand um, functions and modules. Um, and so the, the theory of what you learned uh, applies just about anywhere to any other uh, realm. Um, all you did. Also, Java and C are similar if you're talking Java and not JavaScript. Um, Java and C are very similar to the extent that I took both in college at the same time and failed both <laughs> because I took them at the same time. <laughs> and they're so similar that you, you got to, well, no, this one, this one needs the semicolons at the ends here for these types of statements, but this one doesn't. And then I would get that wrong every single time. And the next thing you know, I'm getting like a D and an F because I don't know where the semicolons go anymore. Um, so, so you're, you're, you're pretty close to C, uh, but unfortunately dangerously close. Um, so you might want to wait a while and then go <laughs> go pick up some C, but yeah. But as uh, as far as learning Java as a means of understanding computer language, um, it's 
it's it's it's good for solid theory, um, but it's it can be messy. Um, Java is really messy. It's all over the map. Um, I wouldn't recommend anyone start learning Java now. Java we're trying to get rid of. Um, it'll be around for the rest of my life, um, just like Fortran is still around. But uh, if you're going to spend your time learning a new language now, um, pick something better. Start learning scripting. Python's taking off, or just learn straight C. Or, you know, C sharp, C plus plus. C C sharp is probably the most ubiquitous. I'm I'm really guessing. I don't know the statistics on that. Um, but nobody likes to write things in Java anymore. Pretty much most of the Java writing that's going on now is to is fixing old Java or updating old Java stuff that's already in enterprises, and that stuff's not going anywhere. And so you're not going to hurt yourself learning Java. It's still a useful skill to have, but I'd recommend you do something that's going to be more forward thinking. Hey, you can like Java. <laughs> right. They, and it's an excellent point. Yeah, Java is incredibly powerful. That people have written tons of modules for it, and that's and like that's what's going on with Python now. Um, and Py, but Python is expanding at a greater rate than Java did for the same time frame. Um, and we're trying to replace a lot of Java stuff with Python. Um, Java can do a lot of stuff, but it, it, it's it's time has passed for what it was used for. The biggest problem I have with Java is that you write a crappy program in Java and it'll still work. Uh -huh. And that's why most of the people when they start learning, they're like, oh, write all this stuff in Java and it's all crappy. But if you write a crappy program in C++, it won't run. That's a fantastic point. Absolutely. Like, yeah. I like that sentence. You can write a crappy program in Java and it'll still work. <laughs> but it, it doesn't teach you anything. Um, specifically for hacking, um, you, you guys probably know most, if not all, of these uh, just because you're interested in hacking and that's why you're here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I like all of these equally for, for what they are. Um, they all serve their own purpose. Go check them out yourselves. I'm not getting into explicit detail on what each one is. Um, I'm not endorsing any of them because I know the people who wrote them. I think I feel the need to say that. Uh, I've actually vetted what's there and talked to the people who wrote them and saw what they're doing. And I said, I like that. Um, I actually had it one of my... Oh, I was at DerbyCon last year or two years ago. Um, a guy from the Mozilla security team actually approached me after my talk, and he was like, why didn't you mention any of this stuff we do? And I was like, what stuff do you do? What are you talking about? And he goes, you don't know, like, the one-and-done program? And I'm like, no. And I sat down with him, and he taught, told me about it. I'm like, all right, all right, all right. And um, I looked into it later, and I actually did a few of them. And, really, and I was like, oh, this is cool. Um, and so, like, what's cool... And I'll just point out the one and done <clears throat> is it's part of the just Mozilla's bug fixing program. They have security bugs or bugs in general that they need fixed. And Mozilla being all open source, they're like, Here, here's, here's the code, here's the bug. Um, if you want to take a crack at fixing the problem, do it. Submit the code, submit your fix here. And uh, here's the documentation for this section of the code we're working with. And if you have a fix, submit it here, and someone on our team will review it, and they might implement it. If they feel like, yeah, that's a great fix, that's legitimate, um, they'll implement it in the code. And, 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 and now your code is in Firefox. I mean, how cool is that? Uh, and so I thought that was, and, and, and they literally just do one and done. Like, you just, I don't got time to be picking through the entirety of, of Firefox's million and a half lines of code. Um, they get, they break that up into nice little chunks where you can grab one, where you go, okay, I really understand the core of how that part of the browser works. Let me look at the code and we'll, and we'll play with it. And, uh, I just thought that was really neat. So, highly recommend that one. But the other, they're all, they're all really good. Uh, excuse me, back to your uh, previous slide. Do you have any suggestions for strategies to learn assembly language? Uh, no, that's that's going way too deep. That's almost that. That's no. <laughs> um, 
Well, it was, you know, again, when you're talking mail reversing or you're talking electronics black boxing assembly is a great um, bit of knowledge to have. Um, Isn't that a good way to learn it? Well, I don't have any resources I can re recommend offhand because I don't have any personal experience looking for any. Um, I learned assembly, and actually I learned, I started with, with uh, a type of Atmel assembly, like not even x86 um, when I was... Uh, not going to talk about what I was doing on video, okay. um, but I, I, <laughs> you can laugh. Um, it was just a personal project I was working on at home, and I did. And this was back in like oh one oh two when even resources on x eighty six assembly were hard to find. Um, now uh, I would say probably look at <laughs> look in that malware reversing realm. Okay. <clears throat> can you think of anybody I could ask? Um, ask. There, there's a website called openexpansion.org or something like that. They have the uh, x86 assembly class and ARM assembly class. Yeah, I'll look into that. He'd do. Yeah, you could try that. Um, here, you could talk to Asobi, who's uh, running the CTF. Okay, cool. Um, if you want to grab Lopi, if you see him walking around, he's a little skinny guy about this tall. Yeah. Um, he'll probably, he might be able to shoot some resources. I only mentioned him because I was talking to him about it a couple days ago. Right, right now. Yeah. Yeah, it started yesterday at 2. Um, and I think, uh, did I bring that up? I'll bring that up later. Um, it runs until tomorrow at some point. And uh, I was going to say, look in the in the brochure, but they didn't print it in the brochure. Um, so you can go check at the, at the CTF table, and I think I'm going to talk about CTFs right now. Yeah, look at that. Good call. Um, so who knows what a CTF is? Who knows what I'm talking about when I say CTF? Cool, about a third of the room. Uh, it stands for Capture the Flag. Who knows what Capture the Flag is in general? Probably everybody. Um, what we like to do... Uh, at these conferences and and now outside of the conferences to play these games called capture the flags where um, a an environment is set up that you are freely freely allowed to hack in pretty much uh, any way possible um, they'll usually set a base level of rules like don't do this or that but anything else is fair game uh, and you're allowed to test your skills and they try to make them really well rounded um, and make a, and they'll they'll make a lot of puzzles. Basically, what it is here's a puzzle. Use whatever tools you have available to solve this puzzle, and in the end, when you solve the puzzle, you get what's called a flag, and you cash that in for some points. And that's the gist of how this works. Um, they try to make the puzzles really well rounded overall, so that they cover the wide gamut of hacking uh, from all the way from just open source intelligence gathering uh, all the way to um, if there's one here, I'll give you a clue. You do need to know some assembly to figure out. Um, and so a lot of people uh, don't do these because they go, well, you know what, I don't have this background as a hacker. I don't really know much about hacking. I don't know a lot about attacking or I don't know anything about crypto, uh, et cetera. And so they just shy away from these. Uh, and especially when you go and you look at the leaderboard and you see there's these teams of people that are that have just like thousands of points in a in a CTF that is a max of three thousand points and everyone's got twenty nine hundred and you're like, well, we're we gonna bother. Um, you're gonna bother because because you're gonna learn something. So this isn't about winning. You're probably not gonna win. <clears throat> um, I did not. I didn't win a CTF. God, I was probably doing CTFs at at cons for like eight years, six, eight years before I won my first one. Um, and this was for this was back in the day when having a team was really highly frowned upon. It was considered cheating. Um, CTFs used to just be one on one and now now teams are encouraged. Um, but regardless, because they try to make these really well rounded, <clears throat> they do don't do it just for the types of puzzles that they are, but they do it for the various uh, difficulty levels. So look for the really low point puzzles to start off and go from there. Like if you have a 5,000 max point CTF and there's a five point puzzle, that's probably something anyone can solve regardless of, of skill level. Um, 
So try the easy ones. Start with the easy ones and don't do it to win. Um, you don't even have to cash the flag in. You don't even have to get your name up on the board if you're like, you feel like you're going to be embarrassed. Like, here's me at the bottom with eight points. Don't even cash the flag in. Just sit in the corner and just play just for you, just to figure out the puzzles. Um, because there's always something in there that every single person can get. And once you get that first one, you're going to go, oh, cool, I got one. And you're going to try another one. And also, you're probably going to have, be, you, you most likely should have been forced to think in a, a different way and think outside the box. And the vast majority of information security is just thinking outside that box. Um, because the box is what people created. And the box is what you're trying to break into. And the box is more of a nebulous thing. Everything inside the box works like it should and is secure like it should be because that's how we built it. But when we built the box, we never thought outside of it that people trying to get into the box are outside of it. They're trying to think of really crafty ways um, that I would have never thought of when I was designing this box to get into it. And so these CTFs really teach you that thinking outside the box and really force you to like bang your head against the table and and stop thinking the way that you've always thought uh, and really get into it. And once you start doing that, you realize that there's this is this is what the bad guys are doing. And you really start to get that appreciation and respect for what the bad guys are doing. So not, so even if you're not trying to get into red team, into uh, offensive security, into penetration testing, if that's not, not what you're looking for, um, this is still great because if you're trying to get into blue team and defensive security or, or developing security strategies as a whole for an organization, this, this teaches you to think like a bad guy. And, and it gives you respect for them and an understanding of how they function. Uh, and you really need that uh, as a good guy. It's absolutely critical. You know, know your enemy. That's, that goes back in human human writing as long as we've been documenting history, the, the know your enemy concept, the art of war. Um, so you, everyone, regardless of what you're trying to get into to do these, because it also teaches you a really cool basic skill set. Basic to advanced, depending on how, how into it you actually get. Um, I, I would say 70% of my skill set came from doing CTFs. Like a massive majority of it came from CTFs, but that was just because I got really obsessed with them. Uh, what's cool about CTFs is you don't have to go to a conference to do them anymore. There's tons of them that happen online, and that's what this slide's about. Um, SANS, who knows SANS? Probably everyone knows SANS. Everyone should know SANS, at least have heard of SANS. Um, one of the very, very, very few respected training organizations um, also insanely expensive. Um, I've taken many of their classes. They do offer really good quality knowledge, quality education. Um, nobody will make fun of you for taking a SANS course. Uh, anybody who gives you crap for taking a SANS course had something bad happen to them in their childhood, and they're just angry people. <laughs> uh, it's SANS, SANS offers quality, quality training, quality knowledge, respected certification. Um, whether or not it's worth the money, that's that's something only you can answer. Um, and unfortunately, you have to spend the answer, the, spend the money to determine if if, if it was. And so, um, most people who take SANS training do it because work pays for it. I've I've never paid out of pocket for SANS training. Um, I I never would personally, because it's like six thousand dollars. It's just, it, yeah. But the trainers are excellent. There, the trainer, there's very few trainers, which is why you see like SANS events are like, hey, SANS is doing training in this city, and like most people will have to fly to a SANS training. It's because they don't have thousands of centers worldwide in shopping malls like a lot of these places, because they have, I don't know how many, but 20 trainers maybe. Um, and all of their trainers are just obsessed with what they do. They love it. They live it. They are passionate. It's in their hearts. And so when you have somebody teaching you something that's in their heart, um, they do a really good job at it and they keep you interested and they really, and, and because they're passionate about it, they know what's important and what's garbage and they don't teach you the garbage. They'll bring up the garbage sometimes and go, yeah, you hear about this and that. That's garbage because of this. Because he's the way better way of doing it. SANS is just excellent. Um, but they do these, these CTFs that are free. Totally free. And they give away prizes. And so, like, if you're embarrassed about doing a CTF in public, uh, at a con, or you just, you, you don't have the time, you're busy because you're spending four hours in a training course. Um, and now you've lost four hours as somebody's out there hammering it away. You can do this in your own home whenever you want. 
And they, they're usually pretty short. Um, they're fun. They're funny. They'll, usually, they'll give you a story and, and some files, and you can get, go to work. Uh, and you can win. You can win a SANS training. Generally, they give away a, a seat in a SANS training or an online training certificate. So it's like it's a few grand of free, awesome training, uh, and also regular free, awesome training because you're doing the CTF, and that's really fun to do with. Uh, a friend, like my old team at work, we would do them all the time. Every quarter, Sans would put out their CTF, and the InfoSec team would all get together, and we'd share notes. And um, that works really well because everyone's got their own focus and thing that they're really good at. And so, sharing notes, you'll learn from the other guy. Like, how did you get this flag? And they'll go, they'll tell you, and they'll go, I didn't even know you could do that. Show me how. And oh my God, we're learning. And uh, next thing you know, you know stuff. Um. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, a lot of cons have uh, encouraged the people who who find flags to do a write-up of how they did it. Say, yeah, okay, cool, you solved all these puzzles. Tell everyone how you solved them. Do a walkthrough. Do a write-up uh, so that people who couldn't solve it can now learn how to solve it. They'll go, oh, and now you know that. So um, look for that. Um yeah, DEF CON. DEF CON always po hosts their CTF afterwards. Um, usually they'll give you, as an attendee, a CD with the CTF on it afterwards. Um, DEF CON always has some hardcore puzzles that are really cool to work on. Do you have a question? Yeah, I just want to talk upstairs at 8 a.m. Um, <laughs> they had 8 a.m. talks? Yeah, yeah they, um, did. they did. They did. I, it was, I didn't even know there was an 8 a.m. Yeah, yeah, there is an 8 a.m. <laughs> hard to catch. Um, Talking about packet wars, a site that. Mm -hmm. So, do you know very much about that, or is it <laughs> not good? Really? But you had a longer question. <laughs> uh, yeah, packet wars is. Just put it on this list. It's another one. Packet wars. Well, I just heard about it. I was trying to point. I didn't know where you would rate it on your. Like, would you? I would put it on this slide. In fact, I should. Do you want to whisper it to me? Uh, CCDC is, sorry, I'm typing, adding packet words in my slide here. Um, CCDC is, uh, it's the National Collegiate Cyber Defense Course, I believe is what it sounds like. Uh, and they do a really cool thing where it's, it's in person and it usually... And you'll have to forgive me because I'm not 100% up on how it's working these days. Um, it's uh, they, it's usually like, it's a red versus blue thing <clears throat> where they get a lot of college kids in. And uh, it's usually done, it's collegiate, so it's college kids. And they have uh, a lot of uh, information security professionals that will go up against them. And... Um, Everyone's trying to break into each other. And the theme is different every time they do it. It's kind of like a capture the flag, but both sides are human beings. Uh, and so you've got people throwing malware at each other. You've got people throwing exploits at each other. Um, you could be sitting there trying to craft something to get in somewhere else, and like your laptop has been exploited, and somebody's in the back end erasing everything that you're saving. Um, that's, uh, that's a little more intense. Um, yeah, maybe I should swap that out for Packet Wars. Because uh, it's also not universally available for everybody. Um, I do that. That's more of an advanced thing. Like, I do that on the offensive side. I'm the InfoSec professional that goes up against the college kids and screws with them for a day. And it's just hilarious. Um, so, yeah, I would replace that with Packet Wars. Let's do that. Uh, I don't keep keep logs keep on that. <laughs> Um, none, I hope. I mean, that's a lot of money to spend and then just drop out. I mean, if you're in college, if you're, like, at least at the halfway point to getting something, I generally say, go ahead and finish that up. Um, I'm not a huge proponent of higher education. I don't know if you can tell that. Um, as someone who interviewed people for for jobs uh, in general, I glossed over their education because uh, because I went to college. And I know what actually happens there versus the fancy words you're putting on this resume. But it looks so pretty in the top. Yeah, I know. 
Um, the thing you got to remember is everybody who went to college who's reading that resume really knows what actually happened there. I know that you had to take uh, six semesters of uh, 14th century French literature so that you can get that master's in information security. <laughs> and so, like, a four year degree is not equivalent to four years of experience, and, and absolutely nothing on earth can ever be better than. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm further along on the IT side than I am on my security side. Who here has worked a job? <laughs> Probably in most everybody. Uh, yeah. You know that, that you'll learn more in your first 180 days at a job than you would from somebody telling you who works that job how to do it. It's, it's just, it's, again, it's how human beings work. It's how we work as a creature. Um, you're going to learn way more from experience than you ever, ever, ever will from having somebody teach it to you. Even if those classes have labs and such, um, it's just not, it's, it, it's, it's not enough. It's not something the education system can ever actually provide. It's, it's why internships are so important. Um, it's why schools push internships because they know that, unfortunately. Companies like to take advantage of you and not pay you for that internship, but that's, that's a political rant I won't get into. Um, a lot of hands going up. Yeah, um, I heard about a Russian CPS called R U T C P F E. That's too advanced. Don't know that one. <laughs> really? Okay. Don't personally know that one. So, I, and, and what I mean by that is I can't okay. speak to it. What I can say is try. Okay. Because a lot of people go, oh, I don't try the CTF because I'm not that good. I don't know anything. It's going to be too advanced. How do you know? You, you didn't try. So go find out. Find out. Send me a tweet. Let me know. You tweet me all the time. Yeah. Hook me up. <laughs> yeah, I know who you people are. I think I don't recognize you. Um, <clears throat> although I talked to you yesterday. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because as soon as you approached me, I knew you were. Because we talk all the time. Yeah. And so I did some open source intelligence on you. Good. And yeah, I mean, if you, yeah. If, this full disclosure, if you guys tweet me, I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna go look into you. Um, just because that's how I work as an information security guy. Um, the, the, uh, one of the other things I'm really good at, uh, that I'm doing for Red Lake is I do open source intelligence, which is, um, finding out stuff on people that's just freely available out there in the internet. And that's how we do, that's how we plan phishing attacks. Uh, we do not only email phishing, but voice phishing, uh, live face to face social engineering. And you got to do a lot of research. You got to come in there and sound like you know what you're talking about. And uh, I really like doing that. And so I do that on people. <laughs> and you can't get mad at me because it's just on the internet. Yeah. It's what doing. <laughs> um, yeah. So you're you're, you're probably not going to win CTA for a really long time. Um, yeah, I think I went into all of this. Uh, one of my favorite points here is that failure is what you want. Failure is desirable. Failure, like when you succeed at something, when you complete something successfully, when you build a birdhouse and everything went according to plan and you didn't cut your finger and you didn't make one of the sides lopsided, um, you didn't learn anything because you clearly already knew everything involved in that and all you did was just lose some time, although you made a birdhouse. Um, so you made some birds happy. The... When you fail, you learn something. Like, because you're probably going to go, why did I fail? What went wrong? Because we as people want to know things. And we're going to go, why, why isn't this working? And you're going to troubleshoot. And you're going to Google. And you're going to ask people. Um, failure is when you go, what went Because we get embarrassed when we fail. And we don't like to be embarrassed. Um, and so we're going to figure out what happened, and we're going to learn how to fix it. We're probably going to fix it, or we're going to at least learn what the problem was. Failure is the best. Failure is how we get ahead. Failure is how the human race has gotten to where it is currently. Just constant, constant failure. If all we did was ever succeed, you'd never move ahead. We'd never build anything new. You can't build anything new. You can't invent anything without failing the first a few times. So fail. Fail every day. 
fail all the time, get out there and fail, that's, that's where it's at. That's the meat and potatoes failure. Um, so what we're going to, let's talk about how to start. It's funny. Go ahead. It's funny. <laughs> um, let's talk about how to, getting a lab in the house for really starting learning some more enterprise level, uh, tools, things you're going to see in the corporations you might go work for, because uh, those are the guys that are hiring like crazy. These corporations are expanding their security teams, like just exploding, just like, we don't care. We just need some warm bodies in here. We don't have enough analysts. We don't have enough human beings to be reading through all of the alerts that these blinky boxes we bought are spitting out. We don't have enough human beings to tune these, so they stop spitting out garbage alerts. We just need base level analysts in here. This is probably the role you guys are going to be taking as your first information security gig. It's going to be a junior analyst, a base analyst role. Analysts are the people who sit and they look at the logs all day. And uh, it sounds boring, and it might be boring to some of you. Um, I don't think it is. I really like it. It's called, or they'll, they'll call it incident response or a DFIR analyst, some, one of those terms. And what you're doing is, is these companies will buy what I what I call blinky boxes, and that's the uh, and not to disparage any of the vendors here, but a lot of the vendors upstairs you see selling. Hey, we sell this box that stops bad guys from being able to do this, and we have this box that sends you emails every time a bad guy tries to do that thing, and uh, that's all well and good, but it. I'm gonna explain why why that where that attitude came from. Um, yeah, it's $500,000 for a box that just blinks at you. It's not a box you can plug in and you're instantly more secure. I mean, maybe marginally more secure. And that's if you just plug it in and then walk away, which unfortunately is what a lot of companies are doing because they don't have the applicants. They don't have the manpower that's necessary because they can't find the people to run that box to set it up, to manage it, to get it rolling. Uh, because if you plug this box in, the default rules on it, let's, let's say an IDS. An IDS is a box that watches all your network traffic. And again, I'm being very high level. Watches all your network traffic. And when something bad, when it, when it, something bad that it's been programmed to recognize happens, it'll tell you, hey, something bad's happening. Unfortunately, a lot of the normal things, it, the, the more traffic on your network, the more normal things are going to look like bad things just statistically. And it's going to start sending out a lot of alerts. And then when you look at those, you go, oh, no, that's just, that's, that's Frank backing up a database. That's normal. And, and you're going to just start ignoring these alerts because they come in constantly. And you're like, oh, that's prob probably just Frank backing up a database again. And it's not. It's, uh, somebody in the Ukraine exfiltrating your database, but you've ignored it because that alert came through all the time and you don't have time to go and tweak that alert inside the blinky box uh, because you've got 600 other things you need to do that are more important because we don't have enough of you guys coming in and, and, and trying to do that role. Uh, and I find that really fun because you get to, you get to engineer stuff, you get to tweak rule sets, you get to watch security alerts come through and then recognize what's good, what's bad, tweak the rule to be better, watch it again. Um, and you can do that in your own house, um, all of that. And I'm going to kind of try to run you through it. And I'm going to give you only like a basic overview because I want you guys to fail at it. I want you guys to not be able to do this the first time. I want you guys to have to Google and figure out what went wrong. Um, I'm not, none of this is misleading. It's all true. This is definitely, definitely true. But I'm not going to walk you through setting up an ESXi server in your house. Where do you have some advice for this? Uh, we'll get into that. <coughs> I know a lot of colleges do like, with Yeah. Uh, so this is, we're going to talk about building the best lab that you can, the, the best lab for you and the best lab you can have in your house and not like the best lab ever because that's going to be insanely expensive. We're going to try and keep the cost down. Um, and try, try and keep the noise down. Um, a lot of us don't, have, a lot of us don't have basements where we can stash a bunch of loud, loud, you know, Dell pizza boxes. Um, I don't. I live in a loft condo in the middle of a densely populated urban area. Um, I, there's nowhere I can put a loud enterprise server anywhere in there that wouldn't scare the neighbors. 
Um, and so this is what I do. This is how I set my lab up. And it's good enough for me, so you're probably all right. Um, highly recommend as far as network hardware goes. Um, stick with Cisco or Juniper. Um, and that's not to say Cisco and Juniper make the best stuff ever, and that's that, and we're not going to talk any further on it. It's that the vast majority of enterprises out there uh, when I say the word enterprises, I mean corporations, large companies, the companies you'd probably be trying to get a job in, where you statistically read most likely end up. Large, the vast majority of enterprises use Cisco or Juniper hardware. And so if you've learned that in your house, you know the back end of Cisco, Juniper, you know Cisco IOS, you know your way around a switch. Um, you're, that's, that's great hard information to throw on your resume because they're going to go, oh, good, because we're all... We're a Cisco shop, and this guy knows Cisco. He, you know, he's run Cisco in his lab at home. Like that's, man, if he's running Cisco at home, he really knows Cisco, and that's that's a psychological thing. Like maybe even you only kind of know Cisco. Like, well, wow, he's he's talking about running Cisco everything in his house. Cisco guy, cool. We're Cisco guys. It's that's that's good. All right, good. And and that, and, and again, that's that's going to be a running theme here. We're just talking about passion. What we're trying to prove here on our resumes and to these potential employers is passion, because we can't prove work experience because we don't have it. Um, and like I said, like education is only mar marginally uh, useful in this context, in the context of putting it on a resume and just handing someone a piece of paper and then putting your hands in your pocket and waiting to see what they say. That education part is kind of not the biggest, the most important thing. Um, so uh, for access points, for wireless access points, we all have wireless access points in our house now. There's there's huge opponents. We're all huge opponents of Wi-Fi in general. Um, but even the guy who's like, no, man, I don't do Wi-Fi. You know, well, everything's wired. He's, he's got an access point somewhere. He's got a little secret access point that he's not willing to admit. Um, grab something um, uh, off the uh, OSWP. This is Offensive Software Wireless Pen Testing, I believe is what that stands for. Uh, who knows Offensive Software? Uh, not Offensive Software. Offensive Security? Cool. What do they make? Kali Linux. Kali Linux. Um, they have one of the, uh, also an excellent, excellent training course, multiple training courses and certifications. Um, those guys are hardcore. That's 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 your serious stuff. That's that's your serious penetration testing stuff. The, the offensive security guys, um, legitimate skill set. You get out from doing that. Um, still uh, expensive, not sans expensive, but expensive. Um, difficult, higher difficulty level for that. You're really gonna have to study and practice a lot, and devote a lot of hours to that. But man, when you come out the other side, you're gonna have a real solid skill set for pen testing. And that's just and that's just pen testing. Um, but like I said, if you're a solid pen tester, if you know how all the attacks work, you're gonna know how to defend against them. Just just by nature how that works. Or you're at least gonna be able to be way better at thinking up ways to defend against them. Or at least delay them enough so that you can get the alert and respond to it. Um, which is for the most part all you can really do anymore. Um, <clears throat> cheap network tap. Network tap is uh, a device that uh, literally sits on a wire and copies all of the packets coming across that wire to somewhere else, and, and that's for the purpose of feeding all of your network traffic into something. Generally, you'd stick that on the back of in your house in the back of your cable modem, which is where you know everything going in and out of your house, which is probably what you care about. Um, or you could um, you can buy a switch that has a tap port on it. And you can tell that everything coming through the switch also copy over to the tap port, and that'll give you your full LAN traffic, which is also something you'd probably want. Um, oh, I recommended the OSWP access point just because if you it, then you then you have it. If you ever want to look into the offensive security stuff, you've already got the hardware. You're all set. You don't have to spend more money buying something else. Um, as far as buying the stuff, I like eBay a lot. Um, I like asset recovery firms. And you can Google that. And these IT asset recovery firms are guys who, uh, like when your company buys 300 new desktops for everybody and they throw the old ones out, they're actually not allowed to throw the old ones out anymore. I believe that 
kicked in last February, um, they have to send them off to a place that, that recycles them. They're not allowed to put them in dumpsters anymore. Uh, and so these places get in these three, six, ten-year-old lap, ten-year-old desktops. Um, but for purposes of what we're doing, we're saying they, they get in three years, three-year-old servers, because generally IT refreshes every three years. And so for what we're doing, what we're doing, a three-year-old piece of hardware, it's great. It's perfectly fine. Um, but <clears throat> these IT asset recovery firms get in this old hardware, and nobody wants to buy it enterprise-wise because enterprises don't buy used hardware. Your company's not going to buy a used server and go, well, I hope it works. We'll see. Uh, they, they buy new stuff because you want the support contract, you need the warranty, and you need to make sure it's you know it's going to work for you. You up, you want uptime. And so because of that, this stuff's usually really cheap at these places, like really cheap because nobody's buying it. And they just keep dropping the price. Um, a lot of them do have eBay stores, and so you end up back on eBay anyway, which is why I really recommend eBay. Um, some places, uh, especially like he was saying, colleges will just do liquidation sales when they do a refresh. They won't want to deal with the asset recovery firms. They'll just say, hey, come buy all this stuff. Oh, yeah, they weigh it. Yeah, get resourceful. You can find this stuff. And and like I said, you don't even need those servers. You don't need those, you know, especially if you don't have a rack and you're out. Well, I guess rack's not that relevant. Oh, the ra the racks cost nothing. I know, yeah. The racks are like, just, they'll throw it in. Like, I will throw in a free rack on every hard drive. And it's like, that doesn't, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. But, yeah. Um, so what, what, you're, what you're trying to build here is uh, an ESXi server, uh, VMware. Is what ESXi is um, for the purpose of running all kinds of things in virtual machines, and that's the gr this is so great because when I did this, when I started trying to do this ten years ago, there was no VMware. Well, it wasn't. You need a lot more resources to have a VMware server in your house, and so effectively, you were just building multiple computers, and you had a, a physical computer for everything you were trying to do and it was insane and I did this in like a three bedroom apartment that we had like seven guys living in and my room was just sweltering year round and that's how it was and so I was I was that guy that we just had computer stuff everywhere we've all seen them um, yeah that was me um, all you need now is just really just this one server this is one VMware server um, and a powerful desktop is fine. You don't need a massive enterprise pizza box. Um, just something you built yourself with stuff you bought off of Newegg or whatever. Um, effectively, a gaming a gaming machine without the high end video cards. It's really what it comes down to these days. Um, you want fast disk I/O, fast hard drives. Um, Special, so I highly, highly recommend SSDs for this. Uh, solid state drives, they're common. Prices are coming way down on those. Um, you want a huge amount of RAM if you're going to be running a lot of virtual machines uh, because you just load them all into RAM. <clears throat> How much RAM is it? Depends what you're doing um, and what OSs you're running. Um, well, it, you shouldn't be running mostly Linux. Okay. <laughs> um, Generally, for if you're if we're seriously just testing attack methodology and and, and, and trying to break into our virtual machines, um, like four gigs per Windows VM, two per Linux overall, you can get away with. Well, yeah, and and you're and you're probably not going to be running six VMs at a time. You're probably going to be running two. Um, RAM RAM is cheap, which is why I'm not putting a whole lot of effort into that part of the conversation. Um, you know, any any motherboard you buy now can handle 16, 30, 32 gigs of RAM plus uh, and, and versus what it used to cost. RAM is cheap. Storage is cheap. Everything's cheap these days. Again, look on eBay. And you don't need to go... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Virtual box. Um, is that work instead of doing a 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, VirtualBox works fine. Um, again, uh, I'm recommending the ESXi server because that's what is what exists in the enterprises. Everybody, more or less, uses VMware. VMware, vSphere, it's everywhere. And so, you know, yeah, you can you can do all of this absolutely with VirtualBox. I tried to build a bare bones box, but there was bare metal Yeah. Yeah, you gotta. You're gonna have to do some, <laughs> some research, and like I said, uh, not giving you all the answers here. Um, you know, check out what you need in order to run an ESXi server. Make sure you get with the right hardware. Um, overall, like I said, disk I/O and RAM is, is your major concern. Um, uh, you're gonna want multiple Ethernet ports inside that box too. Probably at least two. Probably four. <clears throat> and um, what I like to do with VMs is um, do one per major application that I'm running, uh, which seems ridiculous to have a separate server for every for everyone. But what that allows you to do is tweak the operating system that it's running on, and tweak you know if you if you're running it in a Linux VM, you can tweak tweak your IP tables, tweak uh, tweak your SE Linux um, to really just get down to only what that server needs in order to run that one application, which is a huge thing in the enterprise. Because um, in the enterprise, I don't spin up an Ubuntu box and then put my, you know, put Apache on it and launch my website and then go, cool, we're done. No, you have to harden that. You have to spend a lot of time hardening that. Um, one of the reasons nobody uses Ubuntu in the enterprise is because it was made to be very user friendly. It's got a lot of stuff going on. And the more stuff you have going on, the more stuff that's that's oh, the wider your attack surface the more things people can attack to attempt to get inside that box so you want something super narrow so you want to start with like a super narrow clean linux distribution like like your gen 2 like uh, debian's mostly uh what most people will do at home that's pretty good and all right um and the enterprise again we're talking we're talking uh red hat RHEL, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, or the open source community version called CentOS, C-E-N-T-O-S. Um, I personally spin up a CentOS VM for everything that I do because I spent so much time working with Red Hat because it's in the enterprise and that's me. And and we can we can argue that we can argue the distro game all day. <clears throat> um, Um, no, Red Hat, yes, that's why it's easy, yeah, because you can buy support contracts for it, and I mean, Ubuntu's trying to get into that game too, um, but yeah, Red Hat's been doing it forever, and uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, certainly, absolutely. Um, Gentoo is, is great for what it is, um, especially if you're talking about... Um, Building minimalist boxes that serve very, you know, one specific purpose. Um, you know, and you can even run it at home because computers are so fast these days that the whole thing with Gentoo is everything you do has to be compiled from, from the source code. And it could take a really long time to get anything done. But with how fast computers are these days, it's, it's, it's no longer as huge of a deal it used to be. Uh, but because it used to be such a huge deal, a lot of people don't use it. Yeah, right. It was horrible. I was doing a yeah, Pentium three, right. So it just never caught on, but it's it's definitely catching up now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's the wrong slide. You got it. <laughs> um, so so what are we doing with all this? Um, I don't know why I picked this picture. <laughs> this guy. I'm going to tell you what this guy is. Um, this guy here. Is, he's a he was a redditor. He was a completely vegan bodybuilder. He used to post on Reddit all the time, and he's like 70 years old or something. And nobody believed him. He would come in and fight in these fights all the time, and people would be like, "No, man, you can't. There's no way you can build that much muscle being a vegan. You need to get, you need to get these proteins that only exist inside of these types of meats." And and uh, he would get these heated, and then they would just call him out and be like, "No, you're a liar. You're just trying to push this pro-vegan agenda." Uh, and then he starts posting these pictures. 
And he starts posting pictures of like what he's eating, and, he's, and they're like, "Nah, but you're still lying." But anyway, like when he posted this picture, we're all like, "What?" <laughs> And so, like, that's what I was reading the day I made this slide. It was just that. This ripped 70-year-old vegan bodybuilder. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> what are we doing with all this? What are we doing with this VMware box that we're building? Yeah, cool, great. We're building a computer. I've been doing that for 20 years. It's not, hasn't gotten me a job yet. Why are you making me do this now? Um, the most efficient thing I think that you can do with it is run security onion on it. And again, we're talking about getting yourself enough knowledge and experience to get that base level enterprise um, analyst position within a corporation. Um, who knows what security onion is? A couple guys, cool, yeah, all right. Um, The do not run in a VM contradicts everything I just said, and I realized that um, that was an old, this is an old slide, and I'm going to update it right now for you guys. Um, it's a lot easier to run in a VM now. It used to be like just, just horrible. Nobody could get it to work. Um, nowadays, I have a lot of people reporting back, yeah, no, I didn't have any problem. What are you talking about? Why is, why do you say not to run in a VM? So it used to be terrible, and you get a lot of guys like, "Yeah, don't know, it's awful. You can't." And the problem, the problem was that um, it was really hard to get the network traffic into it uh, unmolested. And the whole point of Security Onion uh, is that it is uh, effectively it's it's a self-contained IDS system. And IDS is what we were talking about before, which is where you take all the traffic in and you look at it, and it automatically looks for bad guy stuff, and it tells you when bad guy stuff is happening. Um, and uh, it's wrong most of the time. And that's cool because failure is what we want. Uh, and it's, and, and it's not to disparage security on it or bro. It's, it's, it's awesome. It's just out of the box. That's how it works. And all IDSs are meant to be run and tweaked and run and tweaked because there's no way anybody could ever crank out a perfect IDS for every single uh, network environment and traffic environment. It's absolutely not possible. So they, they ship it out with the safest rule set enabled, and you are supposed to get a ton of false positives off the bat. And you're supposed to go in and account for that and tweak the rules look at the traffic, see what the traffic's doing, see why it tripped that alert, and then try and tweak the rule so that it will no longer fire on exactly what was going on in that traffic that was legitimate, but will still catch the traffic that it was originally designed to catch. Um, <clears throat> and I said that really slow and deliberately because absolutely nobody does this. In the enterprise. In the enterprise. What's that? Nobody, Nobody tweaks their rules. Really? Yeah. What they'll do, they'll loosen it way too much or disable it. Really? Because they don't have the time. Because there's not enough of us. Uh, all the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, I think, I unfortunately know engineer, Linux engineers where that's like step three. It's like spin up the Linux, disable SE Linux. Good work. <laughs> well done, sir. Um, yeah, so Security Onion is this combination of bro IDS. Who knows who's here to bro? It's, it's, it's not as dumb as it sounds. Um, it's actually really good. It's a, it's a, uh, free IDS that you can download and run at home. Um, and is, and it uses rules that all of the enterprise IDSs, well, more or less use. Um, it gives you legitimate, actionable knowledge that you can put right in your resume. Um, and you're going to learn Elasticsearch or Splunk with it. <clears throat> yeah. Got it. Yep. Big red button. Not red, but it's gray. It says stop. Okay. Is it shiny? Hi. That's a different guy. Yeah, it's like a Monty Python sketch. Do you have a funny walk? All right. Yeah. Anybody mind photography? 
Oh, he's probably taking a picture of the back of your head anyway. Yeah, all right. How you doing, man? Good. Good to see you again. This guy follows me around the country and takes pictures of me. <laughs> he's <laughs> It's not even a joke. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, Bro is, uh, I would say, the most widely used in this context, in the context of running at home. Um, I've, I know enterprises that run it. I ran it in one of my old enterprises to fill uh, a need in a very niche situation. Um, it worked really well. Uh, so again, I'm recommending you do things that are that are the most common in in the enterprise that you will be able to do at home. It's a lot of stuff that goes on out there you just can't run at home. But this is the stuff you can, and so a lot of the answers are the questions of why did you pick this instead of that, and like this thing's so much better, why are we doing that? It's because that's what the enterprises use. Enterprises don't always use the thing that's best for the job. They use a lot of times they use what was cheapest, or was what you know who whose uh, sales engineers had the nicest suits, which is what yeah who what sales engineer the engineer brought the cutest women, which is the worst. Uh, the the last enterprise. Oh God! The last enterprise I worked at, um, yeah, that was like if you brought in uh, a super attractive woman who's not an employee of your company and was literally just there to hand out pamphlets and sit next to you and smile, like you you can spot them a mile away, like you know what's going on. That was instant no. You were not. I, we we didn't even consider your product. That's offensive. Don't do that. It's terrible. <laughs> I mean. Out of out of sheer out of sheer politeness, we uh, generally didn't go to lunch with them afterwards. Uh, we it was because it's an insult to your intelligence. It's an insult to women. It's just awful all the way around. It's just uh, luckily I haven't been seeing it going on that much anymore. Um, they're on to us. <laughs> they they know that we know. So yeah. Um, how much we got? We're almost done with this. I'll let you guys. I'll, I'll crank through this and get a break. So, here's all the things you should be running on that on, on that VMware server: um, Security Onion, PFSense, which is an awesome, awesome hardcore firewall that's really going to teach you the meat and potatoes, the ins and outs of what a firewall is and how it works. It's going to teach you. You're going to write firewall rules for this things, and you're going to be like a serious firewall jockey. <clears throat> you're going to take knowledge you gain from this, and you're going to be able to apply it to. Uh, your Cisco firewalls in an enterprise because not only are you learning firewall theory, you're learning Cisco IOS because you have a Cisco managed switch in your house that you bought for $8 on eBay. It's all coming together. It's all happening. We're going to do this. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's outside of the bounds of, the, <laughs> of this class. Like as a... Oh, you mean Sophos firewalls. I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. Um, Um, yeah, um, that's, that's, I separate firewall from UTM in that maybe they may be because I'm just from the old school and UTMs are more of a newer thing. Um, UTMs are great. Um, if you can get one that doesn't, that isn't crippled as soon as you turn on any kind of defensive rule. Um, what does UTM stand for? Unified threat management. That's right. It's one of those buzzword terms. <laughs> Um, and all it is is it's kind of a combination firewall, IDS, and a lot of and they'll, all the vendors will throw in one or two other things to compete with each other and goes ours also does this, ours blinks twice as fast and his lights on both sides, and uh, uh, UTM's they're good because it's kind of, it's it's a hard it's a thing that the box is doing things at the hardware level um, like threat management it's doing your IDS inside of itself. Um, the downside I see in UTM's is that. They're trying to do more than the hardware is actually capable of doing. Um, one exception of that I've personally found is Fortinet. They're actually a vendor upstairs. They have a great <coughs> UTM that doesn't get crippled when you turn things on. And I'm not going to talk about the guys who do because being recorded. Um, Sophos, I don't have any personal experience with. Um, I also don't see it in a lot of enterprises. So can't speak much to it other than I don't see it out there a lot. So probably not the best thing to be learning, if you're, if you're with the limited time that you have to learn things. Um, 
But if you have a, a real interest in it and you have free cycles to learn other things, I mean, yeah, you go ahead. Somebody's running it. They're a big company. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you're going you're gonna to have a Kali VM on this server. Who runs Kali as their, as their default OS? I mean, let, uh, yeah, um, Kali is not meant for that. Um, we, we have an old inside joke. How do you spot a noob? He's the guy running Kali. Um, don't, don't run Kali as your base OS. It's not meant for that. Because what you're going to have to do, if you're really using it as the base OS on your computer, um, you're going to have to start playing with it because it's not going to do things in the way that you want, and you're going to break something. And it's, you're not going to break something because you don't need redoing. You're going to break something because Kali is this teetering pile of things that's just waiting to be knocked over. Everything is set in an explicit way. All the environments are set up just so. And, and it's tested for stability. It's, it, it, but they, and they spend a lot of time getting it just so because you have a lot of really, really weird tools in it that do a lot of non-standard, non-compliant things intentionally because of what it is. <clears throat> and because of that, they need the whole environment overall to be set just so. And as soon as you start screwing with that, you're going to start breaking tools inside of it. And then the next thing you know, all you, all you have is a hacked up Linux desktop when half your Kali tools don't work. Use something else. Don't use Kali as a default OS. It's dumb. It's not, it's not that great for that in the first place. Like, there's way better stuff you can use. I guess with uh, Blackheart could be even worse. Um, it's same concept. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're going to run a Windows server, and not just for attacking. You're going to run. You're going to learn to set up an Active Directory domain. You're going to set up forests. You're going to set up multiple serv ser servers. You're going to set up trusts between those. Um, that's critical. Understanding Active Directory trusts and the whole web of trust is critical to vulnerability, it's offensive security, and understanding, you know, just doing vulnerability assessment. <clears throat> um, those of you looking into being auditors or GRC, uh, you're going to deal with a lot of that, a lot of that. You're going to be hearing Active Directory, Active Directory, Active Directory, Domain, 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 Forests, Trees, Trust, every day of your life. You need to understand that inside and out. Um, most of you probably like if you if you uh, if you have a family at home, you probably are a Windows household, or you have some Windows machines out there. Um, what I did personally is I set up a, a Windows server, Windows. Well, it was an O3 server at the time. Set up Active Directory domain, set up user accounts, joined everyone's computer to that domain, like just like at work. Do that at home. Um, that's what I did. And I mean, the downside is you're going to tick somebody in the family off once in a while when you break something. <laughs> um, I was talking, who knows Ben 10? Yeah, I was talking to Ben 10 he, down at, in, uh, oh no, I sent him a tweet. He sent a tweet out where he accidentally bricked a router in his house because he was, he was, he was doing something interesting and he bricked the router and he just tweeted about it. And I, and I tweeted him back. I go, a man, uh, uh, a man does not know fear until he's bricked the only router in his family's house. <laughs> they will come for you. Your children will come for you. You will have no family. Um, so it, it, it happens, and nothing teaches you to figure out how to fix something quicker than that. You become an instant, instant Google master. You're the Bruce Lee of Google Foo when you break your kid's internet connection. <clears throat> um... Yeah, so besides that, then you're just going to install a bunch of uh, operating systems for the purpose of attacking. Um, you're going to end up installing different versions. You're going to throw Windows 2000 on there um, just to practice your exploit techniques. <clears throat> um, and we will... How are we going to get to that? I don't know. Um, I'll wrap up this thought and we'll take a break. Uh, and so what you're going to be doing there is looking up like the major, uh, like when a, when a new major, oh my God, everybody's going to die, uh, severity 
12 vulnerability comes out and even like channel 5 NBC is talking about it. Um, you're going to want to learn about that vulnerability. Why is everybody freaking out? You're going to want to learn how to perform the exploit, how to actually become the attacker. Uh, and generally, anything that's labeled as that severe that's out there, within a couple of weeks, two to three weeks, there's a there's what's called a POC, proof of concept. And it's some code that somebody puts out that says, here's a program I wrote that perform that exploits this, and that's proof that this is in fact a severe problem. And you can get that code and you can, you know, compile it and run it and attack a system with it and go, holy crap, it works. Uh, and so there's varying levels of how you can go about this. You can be the guy that grabs that code, picks through it line by line, um, and really understands exactly what it's doing, how it's doing it, what it's doing to create, you know, cause the exploit to occur at the code level. Some people aren't code jockeys. Some people don't do that. What you can also do <coughs> is read whatever blog. There's, there's some great blogs out there that talk about exploits. Find one that kind of talks to your level. Uh, and you can read about it there, the varying levels of exactly what's going on in the exploit, what's causing it to occur, why it's dangerous. Basically what I'm saying is like, you gotta do your research. Your morning news should be this stuff. Your morning news shouldn't be, um, what's up with Kim Kardashian's butt today? Um, sorry, man. <laughs> um, it should be this stuff. You should, your, in your morning news feed, who has, who's a news feed? Like Feedly or something or Google Reader. I know one of them is just shut down. Oh, Twitter's, Twitter's critical. Absolutely Twitter. If you're not on Twitter, you need to get on Twitter and you don't need to actively post to Twitter. But for the security community, it's all on Twitter. Twitter is a great way you can tweak, tweak news feeds to get what you're looking for. Um, create Twitter groups of certain types of people. You can have the highly respected guys here. Um, the guys who just post a lot of stuff that's of interest to you. The guys who act like they're knowing what they're talking about, but don't, and you can leave them off to the side, and then you can have the everybody, you put me in the everybody else pile, and uh, I post a lot of cats. <clears throat> um, Twitter's great. I, I like to have all the, all the blogs in my feed. Like, I, I like to read Bruce Schneier. Um, maybe I should have made a, a slide with all the people you should read, but just all the major names. Um, there's, there's a lot of good security podcasts out there, too. Um, one I really like is the Sands. Um, I'm going to Google it real quick so I get the name right. Uh -uh. Um, anyway, the Internet Storm, Internet Storm, Internet Storm podcast is what I'm thinking of. And I was making sure I wasn't confusing it with ISC. Um, that one's great. It's like five minutes every day. Uh, comes out, I think like Pretty late in the day. I think it's like 3 or 4 p.m. CST. Um, and it's, and it's like five minutes on what happened today in security. Uh, and it's, and it's really good. And the guy who runs it really knows what he's talking about. And he has an accent that I absolutely love. Oh, uh, no, it's, uh, oh God, was he Swedish? Some of the Nordic. I can't remember. Maybe German. Something up there. Anyway, you're going to learn how those attack works and you're going to try and, and actually recreate the attack. Um, and so you can do it from like a, a, a compiling the source code and running the binary and figuring out how it works that way. Or a lot of times what people are doing is they're running, they're, they'll write a Metasploit module for it. <coughs> Who knows Metasploit? <coughs> Metasploit is a uh, tool. It's in Kali, but you can throw it on whatever. Um, that is kind of like the quickie, the quickie hack tool. Um, it's a command line based tool where you can, full of proof of concepts for known vulnerabilities for literally everything as long as somebody wrote a module for it. And so you just go into your cal your, your Metasploit and you, you pull up the module, you load it, you give it the information, whatever that module needs, which is usually like a source source IP address and a password hash or something, and then the, the, the server you're attacking. And then you literally you just hit go and run, and it will just perform the exploit against the server and give you whatever you're expecting back, be it a command line inside that server or um, some user credentials or something. So Metasploit is generally like, everyone should absolutely know Met no, Metasploit. Metasploit's a basic tool uh, for offensive security. Um, Metasploit, M-E-T-A-S-P, 
L O I T metasploit. Um, it's it's part of the, the the most basic of offensive security toolkits because it's that it's very script script kitty. It's very much tell it, tell it what you're trying to do and where to do it, and then tell it to go, and it will just go do it. Um, but you can do some hardcore stuff with Metasploit. Um, you can get deep, deep, deep into a network if you get really good with Metasploit. So it's not, not I'm not trying to disparage it at all. It's an incredibly powerful. Uh, but at the top level, it's incredibly easy. <clears throat> and it's great for just understanding, like, okay, I get the gist of, like, how this attack works. Metasploit has a module that will perform that attack for me without having to know an incredibly in-depth amount of whatever. Um, so I'm going to actually do it. I'm going to fire up my my... Windows VM, and I'm going to run Metasploit out of Kali, and I'm going to go and I'll give it all the information it needs and say go, and I'll see. Rarely do you actually just get back a shell, a command prompt on the remote server. Those those exploits are few and far between. Haven't seen a good, a real good one since MS 08067. That's how famous that one was. People finish your sentence when you do that. Um, MS 08067 was the last great easy. I got a command prompt in a remote server, and I can go to town on the thing. Nobody's come up with a proof of concept on one of those since 2008. Just, just wait. Um, so why don't we take a break? It's been an hour and a half. <laughs> um, get up, you walk around, come back, and just. Five, five minutes, five. Let's let's make it an even time. Does everybody have? And do I have? Eleven. Let's say eleven oh five, eleven ten. Yeah, sorry, I put that right. slide back up. Um, yeah, come back at eleven ten. Take a walk. Yeah. This was already paused. It was already paused, which is disturbing, but whatever. Yeah, so what? Right. That's the idea. Okay, so even like go try it and suck at it and fail. Okay, that's what that's literally. Like most, to be honest, like most of the uh, stuff that you had written on the server page seemed like gibberish to me. Oh, okay. So yeah. Um, which server page? Uh, the the first one. The slide. Like I know. This one. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm yeah. very new to the security. Or to IT in general? Yeah, yeah. Like okay. I, I've had a computer for years, but that's pretty much, I started computer science uh, school this year, and then that's pretty much Okay, it. yeah, maybe I should talk about that, the, the concept of um, uh, security is such a vague term to use because it literally is, is part of everything. Um, you need a vague term because it's such a massive realm. And <clears throat> because of that, you need to know, you know they say like all IT, go, all IT guys know a little bit about a lot of stuff. For security, you need to know a lot about a lot of stuff. Um, generally, you move into security from other parts of IT's of IT, whether you were a network engineer for a long time, or you were a network engineer and then you moved into Windows admin, and then I'll, I'll see that a lot: network engineer, Windows admin, security, or network engineer or, or uh, database admin, Unix admin, security. Usually, you'll get like two to three. Let's call them undergrad degrees in the, in, in these other fields. And then you'll really have a solid foothold in how okay. the wider realm of computing works from that. Um, and, the, and the wider realm in a deep, 
you, you're deep into that wide realm, and then you'll be able to move into security, and then that'll be your like w the things you'll be really good at security at securing are going to be then you know if you did network network admin, you'll probably be really good at network security, you know, you'll probably be really good at Windows security because you're going to you know Windows admin stuff, and usually that's how you get your fortes. I mean, like I said, not no nobody in Infosec is great at everything. Um, people think we are. People like to put us up in these pedestals, like, oh, fucking Johnny Christmas, he's a pen tester, Manny breaks in anything. Um, it absolutely is. Every, every three days, a new vulnerability comes out. And when I'm telling you guys, like, hey, go read up on that vulnerability, understand how it works, look at the code, run Metasploits, you had to do I, That's what I'm doing. I'm not telling you to do it as beginners, and then there's more advanced techniques that you'll learn later. This is what I'm doing. Every, every three days, this is what I'm doing. Yeah, and then I, and then what I garner from that is like, oh, this is a garbage exploit, or this is stupid because all it gets you this, and you can't. You, there's nowhere you can go for once you're here. Like, yeah, it's a vulnerability, and it's something. Like, the end result is all I'm able to do is like dump a bunch of names out of their DNS server. But I was able to do that anyway, so it's not like uh, it, it gives. It, it, it's great for destroying a lot of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that the media gives you. And, um, but and it really it keeps your skills up and. There might be a time when I can't dump a bunch of names out of a DNS server for some reason, and I need to. And I go, oh, there was a there was a phone for that, and I'll go Google whatever that was, and I go, yeah, let me see if it's vulnerable to that. And I'll run a quick scan against it. Like sometimes, like uh, there's there's vulnerability scanners like Nessus, and uh, I should touch on that Nessus and. Uh, Qualis are the big ones. Nessus has a great free one. And what that does is just scans whatever you point it at and tells you what known vulnerabilities it's most likely susceptible to based on what Nessus found. Um, Nikto. Nikto's a big one. It's okay. Um, God, you're right. There's another one. Um, but Nessus is, is great. It's free. Uh, one of the oh, big... One big engineer for Nessus is here. Um, he's running a few things. Steve McGrath, he's got a straw hat, ponytail, glasses, kind of bigger guy. He walks around with a satchel. Hardcore Nessus engineer. A uh, really good friend of mine. I like him a lot. We have cigars all the time. And he's cool because anytime i got a problem with Nessus, like I'll call him and he doesn't get pissed about it. I'm like, yeah, what? I can't find documentation in the API for triggering this when that happens. And they'd be like, hang on. And they'll throw the old IT guy, hang on, or move. <laughs> yeah, or he'll throw me a Python script, and I'll go, cool. Um, yeah, so that's, yeah, you're, a lot of people do want to get into InfoSec because it's cool and hot and sexy and the salaries are high. And it's, it's, it's cool. And I don't mean to be insulting, like, yeah, everybody, you guys think it's so cool. It is cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, and personally, I, I'm more of a fan of the defensive side, in all honesty. Um, I'm really just doing pen testing to fill in a few gaps I had on my resume. Uh, I'd really like to go into back into enterprise defensive, um, which nobody says out loud. Everybody, everybody wants to be the burglar. Everyone wants to be the bank robber, you know, because that's what's cool. We all want, we all secretly want to be the bad guy in our heads, because they're the, the guys with the black hat and the cool guns. Um, but in reality, like pen testing gets monotonous. It's the same thing all the time. Everybody's vulnerable to the same stuff. You rarely find anything new or cool. Um, that's why I like doing electronics pen testing because at least like every piece of electronics you get is different. Except now, everything is ARM. Everything is is becoming the same in electronics. You used to have Every time you got a security camera, is running some other processor. Now it's all the same. Now it's all ARM. It's all some MIPS. Um, bin walk. I rarely, for what I'm doing, I personally rarely. Uh, have to go beyond bin walk. Um, I 
use it to learn how to do that. Yeah, like. I want to take a. I work for a list. Yeah. And uh, we have some old canopy hardware, and they just they just pump on it PTA with old old arrows. Oh, okay. Yeah. So right. Gonna, right. Yeah, FPGA. Yeah. Yeah, fun pro right, fun project. Even if you don't get any money out of it, right. But you learn something and it was fun. And like we do a lot of dumb stuff that <laughs> that is fun that we don't get anything. Like in the end you just go, Oh well now that's done. Um Yeah, no, I like Binwalk a lot a lot. Uh it's got practical applications. Um like what I just just making sure the camera's off. Um I just uh I was doing a pen test for a client and one of one of their HQs was in Jamaica and we uh I found a polycom video conferencing phone video conferencing system uh, uh in their DMZ like on a public with a, like a public IP like didn't even nat like public IP went right to this this video con and and default credentials on it and so now I'm in like you can watch like what we did is like we I launched a call to another HQ screenshotted the actor that I was able to watch the video like this is wide open and then uh, and then it's like okay cool so what so you got a finding there and what, and what we wow we do with pen testing is uh it's like the bad ones will just go here's all the IPs all the servers I got into here's how here's what I found on them and I'll see you later um, the good guys what we do is you break into a server and then you go okay what does this machine have access to now? What other machines could I get into from here that I couldn't get into from outside? And what you're doing is we call it pivoting. And you're, 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 you're hopping across a network. Hop, hop, hop. Sometimes you get to hop in weird directions a lot until you get to the treasure. It's like Parcheesi. I don't know. And, and yeah. <clears throat> right. And you go, and, and what a lot of companies do is they go, yeah, well, we don't care because we're not on that server anyway. So, well, that's low priority. But that server talks to a lot of database servers. Um, yeah, and so what was I getting at? Oh, yeah, so this Polycom system, which is, um, it's it's not even a server. It's not, a, it's, it is a computer, but it's it's not like a Windows box. Um, uh I figured out, you know, because we were in it, I was able to get, like, what make and model it was, go to Polycom site, grab all the tech docs on it, look at the, sur the support manual, um, uh, saw that it has, has for, you know, upgradable firmware. I was like, oh. And I said, I wonder if I can get a shell on this box. Uh, let's see, you know, let's see what, what's in this firmware. So just bin walk, dump the firmware, uh, run it through and go, yeah, it's just a tiny little Linux OS this thing's running. Um, and I'm like, cool. So I expanded it, looked into it, long story short. Um, and uh, what you do generally <clears throat> when, you're, when you're hardening Linux is you will remove the ability of certain accounts, or in this case, all accounts, to get a shell. So even if you, like, you try to log in as root or whatever, it's, it it logs in as root and then goes, but you don't have a shell, so you can't do anything. See you later. Um, and, and so all they did in the, I call it the config, uh, was for the root user. It said root. It usually goes user, and here's the shell for that user. And it was like, the shell is bin bash. And it was like root bin uh, bas. Like they just deleted a letter. Instead of like commenting it out or just deleting the whole line, they just like changed it to a shell that didn't exist. And I was like, that's the laziest fucking. So, and so all I did is I added the H back in, set a root password that where I knew it would be, recompiled it, flashed the firmware back onto the Polycom thing, which it was able to do because it's a public IP, and it was default credentials, flash the firmware, reboot the box, come, oh, oh, and then I, I set it in the firmware to, to set a reverse tunnel back to me. Uh, so it it opens a shell back to me, you know, and, and it, now now I have a Linux server where none existed before, because you had a phone system, a telephone system with default credentials, like stuff like that, and that's what I mean, like thinking outside the box. Um, 
because who would think to do that? You go, oh, great, so I found a stupid phone system, but I can't do anything with it, so I'll just write that down and go to the next one. Hang on a second. Now I have, now I have a host in your DMZ that, that, that talks to plenty of other things. I have a host I can execute commands on. I can, uh, granted, it was tiny. I mean, the thing had, like, the actual firmware space was, like, 512 megs. Like, you can't. But, you know, I was able to drop a few useful binaries into it and proceed from there. Um, but yeah, I like Ben Walk a lot. Anyway. Um, I should probably get started. We're what? I said, yeah. no, and we're over. Um, I have a few questions that we don't have time for right now. Yeah. And I know you're busy, but you by chance have any time this weekend, or can I shoot you a message or something? You can always shoot me a message. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, rare, rare is the time this weekend I have to sit down and chat. Yeah. yeah. Um, but basically, it's like, I want to get into some pen testing around my knowledge. I have like, uh, I'm, right now I'm doing firewalls. And last year I did some uh, Denny Management, Active Directory, stuff yeah. like that. But it's kind of like, from a new person, kind of like, you know. Um, that's it's a big seat because you said <clears throat> security is such a wide range. Yeah, you know? well, right, like I said, it's a wide range. You got to figure out what you want to get into. So but then att attacking what? Like that's what you got. Yeah. yeah. Like, are we attacking Polycom servers in Jamaica? Like, I was just yeah, like, yeah. what are you? <laughs> no, but if I, you know, I want to get some of that pen testing knowledge so I can take it back and you know better defense. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, and I think but that's what we're talking here. Range, it know. is. And that's what I was talking here about, you know, learn the exploits. Uh, and learn, uh, Metasploit's going to be your first and foremost. That's your primary tool. Um, especially if you're talking something you take back to the enterprise. Um, Metasploits, and learn, learn your Metasploit, learn your basic attacks, like your cross-site scripting, your cross-site res uh, response forgery. Um, and a lot of that's in those sites. WebGoat is really good for that. That's in the, the earlier slide. Um, um, Learn how those work, why they work, and that's a lot of googling and reading. And then, so yeah, I'll, I'll shoot you. Yeah. I'll get you on Twitter or something. And yeah. Contact. Yeah. Okay. Right. <clears throat> All right. Are we all back in here. Close that door up. Yeah, I guess. You. Honestly, I'm pretty sure it was off before, but I'll humor him. All right, so once you have this all set up, like I was saying, it's like, well, so what? Great, I got a computer. Um, here's here's the skill sets that you want to come away with um, and focus on. This is what I slash we, as people who are looking for base level candidates, would really really like to see. Uh, on your resume, and again, when I say on your resume, um, I don't mean in a, in a professional capacity. I mean listed somewhere on there. Like you're going to have a section that says, "Here's here's what I do at home," and 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 not in those words, but I, you know you could call it uh, uh, extracurricular learning, something like that, and uh, work those in there. And so. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> As I was telling just this gentleman during the break, in IT, they, the, the stereotype of IT guys is we know uh, a little bit about a lot of stuff. That's that's the old phrase. Um, security guys know a lot about a lot. You have to. Because security is embedded in everything. Every part of IT involves security. Needs security has to have security forced upon it sometimes. And uh, because of that, you, 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 need, you need to have a good solid level of, base level of IT knowledge in general. Um, a lot of people move into security from, they'll be network admins, and they'll move into like Windows or Unix administration or da database administration, and then they'll move into security. Security is usually a third hop. Um, 
but because we need so many base analysts, and a lot of ITs are, IT guys aren't willing to move into a base position as their third hop. They're either looking to get into, you know, lead engineer or move over into management, which is another problem we're seeing. We just don't have enough people. And so um, if you can at least get this under your belt, and, I, and don't worry, I'll explain what it all means. Uh, if you can get this under your belt, <clears throat> you have a great chance of getting into a security role without having that past five years, five, six, seven years of IT experience, IT engineering experience. Um, who knows what Wireshark is? Wireshark should be most, if not all of you. Uh, Wireshark is the de facto tool for sniffing packets. Um, and that's for taking a look at what's coming across the wire, the network wire into the computer um, at, at the level or layer two and above all the way through the OSM idle. Um, it is incredibly complex. You can do crazy stuff in Wireshark. You can sniff out and extract all kinds of things. Um, there is no single person who is an absolute master of the entirety of what Wireshark can do. Um, there are absolutely masters of individual aspects of Wireshark. There are Wireshark ninjas out there. Um, you don't need to be a Wireshark ninja. You don't have to be a master of any one aspect of Wireshark. You have to have a really good solid knowledge, solid knowledge of how to navigate uh, TCP IP connections and, and sessions um, within Wireshark. And there's, uh, there's actually an um, uh, No, not true at all. Check, check Sam next door. Um, Sam, an old co-worker, is actually teaching next door an inter basic to intermediate class in Wireshark. Uh, and he, he started putting this class together and he goes, I learned so much about Wireshark just putting a class together to teach something I already knew. And I was laughing so hard. He goes, because, um, anyway, we won't get into that. So, yeah, you need to know Wireshark. You need to know TCP IP and Wireshark. Uh, and I mean that at like the base level of TCP IP. Um, I don't mean learn the in TCP IP in and out because um, I have a beautiful book uh, from No Starch Press on TCP IP and it's, it's this big. It's huge and it's hardcover and I keep it on my desk as a reference manual. Um, don't read that. <laughs> you can if you want. Uh, I've read it cover to cover over the course of several years, and it's very dry. Uh, but man, TCP IP is incredibly complex. Um, learn it as you need to beyond the basic functionality of how it works. But you need to know how network, how TCP IP sessions work, how they're established, how they communicate, how they maintain communication, what causes them to die, uh, how to force them to die. Uh, how to force them to stay open, things like that. Um, and as far as Wireshark goes, you need to know how to trace a TCP IP session from, from handshake uh, all the way to its end, whatever that end may have been. Um, it's not incredibly complex. It's easier than, I, than I'm making it sound. Um, you should learn how to forge packets, and I mean network packets. Craft your own network packets for the purposes of sending at other machines. A lot of exploits involve uh, custom network packets, because sometimes uh, when you're when you're doing an exploit, especially if you're doing what's called fuzzing, um, you're going to send packets with specific payloads inside of them, specific types of information that no application would be doing on its own. You can't open up an application, say connect to this computer, and it will send those types of packets. Um, you have to know how to make those packets by hand. Uh, my favorite tool for that is called Scapy. It's uh, S C A. PY or dot .py sometimes it's put. Um, it's a Python script that will let you craft packets of various types with various payloads for various reasons. Um, excellent Python tool. Um, that's definitely critical. So that, uh, um, you need to know HTTP within Wireshark. How to follow HTTP sessions. Um, from beginning to end and understand exactly what's going on every step of the way. Um, you should know um, basic HTTP communication, and I'm, and I'm telling you this because this is what you're going to come across 
when you're working in that enterprise as a base analyst or a base engineer, you're probably going to get stuck running the web filter or the web gateway or uh, anything that gets in between users and the internet. And whenever something goes bad with the internet, the users are going to blame security because <clears throat> you have the most stuff in the way. And so you're going to have to go in and more often than not prove it's not you, but you're going to have to know how to prove it's not you. And I, as security engineer, would rather not have to teach you basic things like how HTTP works. Um, I was lucky enough to have been taught that in high school in like 1996 when the internet was first starting to be ubiquitous. But I realize it's not happening anymore. So understand how the HTTP protocols work. Understand how the TCP IP protocols work as far as just establishing and uh, establishing communication and how to look at that in Wireshark. You should be able to do that in a day or two. That's not a huge deal. Um, but then what you're going to do is, is uh, once you have that base knowledge, you're going to go into SIEM analysis, which is security information event management, which is a fancy term um, that you're going to want to put on your resume because you're doing it at home. And that's what we're talking about with the IDS, where you're, you're looking at the alerts that are coming in. Uh, you're seeing why they triggered. And how are you seeing why that, that alert triggered? You're looking at the traffic that was captured. You're looking at the packets that uh, your IDS that you set up before captured, and you're opening them in Wireshark, and you're following the TCP IP, you're following the HTTP, you're following whatever the communication is, and you're looking at what's in there. You look at the rule and you understand what, how the rule works, because generally the rules, you're able to take them apart and fairly somewhat easily read through them and go, okay, I see, so this rule, if it sees this and this in this amount of time, fire the alert. Okay, so let's find those things in these packets. I saw this and this, this amount of them. Oh, and you're going to go, it's a false positive because it's, uh, my favorite example is we had one that would, we, we didn't allow IRC usage in one of our enterprises. Who knows why? Botnets slash file transfer. Same, same same thing really. Botnets slash exfiltration slash yeah, everything botnets do. Um, and so we just blocked IRC usage. And so the IDS would trip if somebody was trying to use IRC. And <clears throat> um, we kept getting these floods of alerts that would come in. And so I looked into it uh, because I was I would look at the packets. I'm like, there's no IRC. There's, there's, there's there's no connection to IRC server. Uh, this is all HTTP data. Like, what's, what's going on here? Who knows what IRC is? I'm just make sure. I'm talking. All right. IRC is a very old, very, uh, still very heavily used um, chat client on the internet. It's one of the first ones. Um, it's very heavily used for botnets. It's generally how botnets are coordinated and, and, and commanded. Uh, so, but it's also used for for regular chat for benign purposes. Um, and so I'm, I'm picking through the packets and I'm going like, okay, well, this alert is firing on something that's inside these packets. Let's figure out what. And I read the alert and the alert, the, the rule says, was fire on this string. And it was a string that's found in all eight, in, in part of the IRC protocol that that's part of the connection to a server protocol. Um, that string also existed for a completely coincidentally in a sentence that um, the Super Bowl website was use, was using on one of their pages. And so whenever someone would view this Super Bowl page, which is fairly common because it's the Super Bowl, the IDS would go, oh, someone's connecting to IRC, and it sent a bunch of alerts out. But to figure that out, I had to use some, some basic knowledge of HTTP and pick through the packets and, and, and read the rule. And generally, they don't make IDS rules hard to parse as a human being because they know you have to understand and tweak them. They're written as humanly as possible. And you go... And so you look in the rule and you go, all right, let's find this in these packets. You have to be a human IDS for a minute, which takes way longer than an IDS does. It's way longer. But you know, you know you're not going to come up empty handed because the IDS doesn't make mistakes. It makes false positives, but it doesn't make mistakes. It doesn't accidentally screw up once in a while. It does what you tell it to do. Uh, and so you have to look for what's in those packets and you go, that's why it's that. And then you can tweak the rule a little bit. And so that's what you're going to be doing with all this stuff that I just told you to set up is that sort of thing. Um, and that is, that is critical. That is the thing I see these guys coming out of colleges 
in universities with masters in information security, and they don't know how to do day zero of this. They know the theory. They heard about it once in one class one semester, but they've never done it, which is bizarre. Like, you could easily set, I showed you how easily you set up a lab in your own home. There's no reason these universities can't set a lab up, have you do a lab day, and it shouldn't be lab day. It should, it's something you have to do all the time to really get a base level of skill, like anything else. Um, like, you could change the brakes on your car once and, and understand how it works, but the next time you do it, if you haven't done it in five years, it's probably going to take you an hour again. If you do it weekly, you're going to be really fast at it. Um, and so this is what you should be doing. This is what you should be doing in your spare time when you have it. And I understand everyone's spare time varies. Um, so depending on how much spare time you have to dedicate to educating yourself, that's how long it's going to take before you're really going to be at, you know, up to speed on that. Um, and you should have a solid Linux skill set. Because we get a lot of guys in who are like, yeah, I know Linux. I use Linux. I like Linux. Uh, but they don't know. Um, is this basic stuff like setting file system permissions, um, how to how to automate stuff using like the built-in things that Linux has for that? Um, all these things, are, the, all these things like NFS, SMB. This is this is for network file sharing. Um, Cron is an automation. It's, it's literally a timer that executes commands when the clock hits a certain thing, but it's used for for system maintenance and administration. Um, this is real easy stuff to pick up on. Like you could probably read, I bet there's a single blog post out there that just, here's all the basics of, of this stuff. Um, bash scripting. Somebody brought up bash scripting. You? Yeah, absolutely. You should know bash scripting. Uh, and, and I don't mean you should be a guru at it. I mean, you should know how to write a few if, if then loops and for loops and bash for, you know, you know what I'm talking about? If then for, um, just that. And then, like I said, Python uh, or PHP is real, common, it's another scripting language. Again, PHP is the harder of the two. Highly, highly, highly recommend Python. That's why I put Python in caps all the time. Um, let's talk about certifications. Um, this is what I get all the time. Um, I can't get a job because I'm not certified or I'm working, I'm taking this certification class and once I got that's this cert, then, then I'll get that job. Once I get the CEH, uh, then it'll not be a problem. But, you know, I've been studying for six months on it, and I take this weekly class, and it's costing me $1,000, but it's going to be worth it. Through my, i got to get my CISSP. So everybody wants a CISSP, and so I can't get a job unless I have a CISSP. Um, it's patently untrue. Um, I uh, Between the years of, of 2000. Six and 2015, four, 14, uh, I got no certifications whatsoever. Uh, and I had, and I was ex exponentially pushing my career forward with every job hop. I was moving uh, significantly upwards every time I changed jobs, and I changed jobs four times in that period. Didn't get cert zero. Um, they're not necessary. Um, that being said, uh, I'll, I'll soften that a little bit. Um, don't, don't spend all your time studying for some certification. Just don't. You're wasting your time. Um, you're wasting your time because that time should be spent doing what everything we just talked about. Um, they're not silver bullets. They're not the thing that's going to get you a job. Do not tell yourself that you're lying. Having any cert, single cert, you cannot walk into a building and hold your certification up and they'll go, oh, oh, let's get your desk ready. It's that, no, absolutely not. Um, don't get a certification in order to learn something. Get it because you have learned something. Get certified in something that you already know, definitely. Drop a few bucks in. Like, if you know everything to get a certification, go get it. Because you're not spending any time studying. You know, I mean, you probably have to cram for it a little bit, sure. Um, because certs are weird, and they ask you questions that don't apply in real life. Um, so you'll, you'll always have to study for a cert a little bit, but don't spend six months on it. Uh, unless it's like your CCIE or something. Um, and that's, that's, that's what... 
that's what certification, even outside of IT, like that's why it was created. As you know, a, a, an unbiased way of saying, yes, this person does know this. And like you learn all of that and then you go get certified and it's, and it was an easy way of proving it to people. Um, certs, I recommend for their educational value listed there. You can Google what those are. Um, CCNA is a Cisco one. Um, CCNA, I love just for it, how much of a knowledge of TCIP and basic networking it forces on you without being garbage. Like, I don't like the Network Plus because it's too basic. Like, Network is, <laughs> Network Plus is like something I would tell my dad to go learn if he wanted to set up his home network. CCNA is a really good core, core knowledge of stuff. Um, Red Hat certifications, RHC, OSCP is the offensive security, the Cali guys. That's a hardcore one. Um, GIAC is SANS. That's what they call their certification system. I can't remember what it stands for, but um, I, I talked about how I love SANS, and so there it is. But like I said, they're pricey, uh, especially the classes. Um, but if you want to study for circuit certification for the purpose of learning new information, um, those are the four I would I would name off the top of my head. Um, most certif certification requirements that you see on job postings, like it says must have CISSP, must have whatever, and you go, oh, I'm not even going to apply for that job because I don't have, the, I don't meet the requirements. That's again, that's you getting in your own way. It's garbage. It's not true. That's um, something <sighs> HR stuck on there for whatever reason. Um, and I'm going to tell you real quick how to get get around that. Um, <clears throat> If you have, like, if a guy came in and he had a, had, and he proved a passion to me for this stuff, and he had all of the knowledge that I described in the last a couple of slides ago, where I was like, here's the stuff you should know. Um, and he was, or had a lot of professional knowledge, had experience and all the stuff I'm looking for. Like, wow, this guy's been doing this 10 years at a major company. And he really knows what he's talking about in the interview. But but he doesn't have that CISSP we asked for that we said was a requirement. I'm sorry, i got to turn him down. That's not true. That never happens. That's never like, oh, I'm sorry, man. You're really cool, though, but you don't have these letters on your resume, so I, and you got to go home. Um, that never happens. I'm sorry, that, that does happen. And where that happens, uh, primarily where I see it is the government. Um, the government is very much by the book. The government slash military slash... Uh, government consulting, like DARPA contractors, et cetera. Uh, they're very much on or off, very binary, yes or no. And they're the ones that go, you have to have your CISSP or we're not hiring you, regardless of how awesome you are, which I think we'll uh, I'll, uh, agree as far as reality goes is complete garbage. Like if they, you have a perfect candidate and they're just missing the certification, that's dumb. But that, that's where I see it. Corporations, generally, it doesn't happen. What will happen is the guy who's interviewing you, the manager of the team you're interviewing for, is going to go talk to HR and just get that swept under the rug. Um, <clears throat> so how do you... So the topic, and it came up earlier, um, they put these requirements on there. HR puts these requirements on there saying, oh, it needs to have a CISSP. And a lot of, a lot of times it happens because... The manager of the IT team has to tell HR what they're looking for, and they say things like, uh, someone with a CISSP would be good. Uh, just like, because you're, it's IT telling a very, very non-IT person how to look for an IT candidate in an email. And it's never going to work, but that's how, that's what happens. So, um, and what's even worse is there's a lot of, filtering systems that go on on these job application websites that'll that'll dump your resume into a no pile before a human being ever even saw it. <clears throat> and it, the way those work is HR types all the th requirements, do a bunch of fields in this server, and you upload your resume. We've all done it. Please upload your resume. We've all created a malicious PDF and sent it to see what we can get away with. <laughs> and uh, um, And then you never hear back. And then 
uh, you'll call the guy who told you, yeah, no, who, that you networked with, who told you, yeah, you know what, this sounds good. Upload your resume. Let me know when you did it, and then uh, I'll get it pushed through. And then you'll call them a week later and go, hey, did you just wonder what's going on with that? And they go, I never, never saw your resume, never. And it's because the system dumped it because you didn't have you, you didn't have these letters. It couldn't find this sh string <laughs> in your resume. And so, quick dirty trick. Dirty trick for getting past that. This is filthy. Put those letters on your resume. Um, if you want to hide them in, like, a super dirty, sketchy way of doing it is hide them in white text. <laughs> um, you can hide them in the metadata. You can try hiding it in the metadata of the document if, but generally any good system like that is going to tear all that metadata out. Um, what I like to do to keep it on the up and up and on the level and not being sketchy at all um, is find a way to work those strings into what you're talking about on the resume. Say, pursuing, pursuing currently studying for, um, working with subjects uh, often related to. Throw those strings in there. That's the dirtiest trick I'm going to teach you today. And that's, uh, that's how to defeat HR. That's a vulnerability in HR that you can actively exploit to today. Um, gosh, it's almost noon already. Uh, I'm going to let you guys have one more break now because I'm going to I'm going to sw switch slide decks entirely here. Um, we're going to talk about networking, um, which is one of my favorite topics: human human networking. So this is the end of like the skills based thing. Um, Let me make it show me my slides. Make it make it PowerPoint. Um, this 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 the, there's your end goals. That's what you should be googling. Um, and really, really, it's this. It's this middle piece. That's the big one. And that's what you're going to be doing. Your bro, your IDS. You're looking at your own network traffic. You want to do fun stuff. Get get bro running, and then go download some garbage. Some stuff you know is just garbage, <laughs> garbage adware. Download it in one of your VMs, run it, and watch the network traffic that comes out of that thing. Just throw it right in Wireshark and just watch, watch what it's connecting to. Download some garbage adware from some crap site and watch it make 60 connections to 60 different servers. And you just go, oh my god. <laughs> like that's, that's what's going to keep you interested, and then and then, within the confines of that VM, um, check out those servers. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, yeah. So go ahead and take take another take take five minutes. Get up and stretch. Get some water. I'm going to get some water. One p.m. If anybody has snacks they can share, I think everybody <laughs> is probably getting hungry. It's coming up on noon, I know. Earlier, did I hear you right? Do you think penetration testing can be boring for Oh, sure. Absolutely. But isn't that what you do? It is. Oh, yeah, here's a great point. So I, I was commenting on how I'm a pen tester and how it can get really boring. Because uh, it's very repetitive, you just switch clients and do the same thing over again. It can get really exciting. Like when you, when you, when you start getting deep in, you get excited, and then 18 hours have gone by. But overall, it can get really boring. And uh, I, and I honestly prefer doing defensive engineering. Um, so why, why are you a pen tester? You're so great, and you can have any job you want. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I just I had a, a professional gap on my resume for it that I was just trying to fill in. I'm just rounding out my resume. And when you only have an average staying time of 18 to 24 months in IT in general, um, it doesn't look that bad to be job hopping that often. You don't want to do it 14 times. But if you do it once, once you know, every four or five years, you have a little two-year stint somewhere, you do that once in a while. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't look that bad in IT. We're used to it. And so, yeah, I'm just, I, I was like, you know, I'm going to go grab a pen testing job, really fill in that, because I had a lot of personal red team experience, hobby stuff, like what I'm telling you guys to do that I listed in the bottom, like here's what I play with at home, here's, you know, do a lot of electronics, black boxing, et cetera. Um, and I was like, 
All right, I'm far enough along where I can I can definitely take a break from this and start. And, and let me try to get some professional experience and throw that in there now. And that's that's what I'm doing now. Just rounding out my resume. Yeah. So, what areas do you find most exciting? And you guys, you guys go. I mean, this is, we're we're officially on break. <laughs> most exciting about what? No, what areas of the uh, infotech do you find most exciting? For? Oh, that's impossible to answer. Really. Because I get it, like there's no entire field that I'm just excited about. Okay. Like, like there's no, it, like it's too vague, it's too huge. There's nothing like, there's there's things like, I think I find generally what we get excited about is the things we don't know that sound really cool. Yeah. And I think like anything else, like once you start doing, yeah, go ahead. Well, once you start doing it professionally, like anything else, you just like there's boring parts of it. Yeah, yeah. Nothing is just a, just mind-bogglingly excited every day. It's the gray button on the right. Um, it's like any like like uh, there's a guy here, Robert Buck, who's an amazing sales engineer. Um, he lied. There is red on that page. All right. <laughs> and you'll see him. He's a guy about this tall, shaved head. Usually, always wears a suit. Presents himself really well. He's really confident. Um, he's a really good friend of mine. Um, he's a skydiver. He's got hundreds of jumps under his belt, <clears throat> and he'll tell you. And any sky, any professional skydiver will tell you. Like, you get bored of jumping out of planes. And like, what? What is? What a weird sentence, right? Yeah. Like, I don't know, man. Like, I got two hundred jumps, and it's like I just don't feel like skydiving anymore. Like, yeah, right. And it's like, oh, it's, it's too much work. I gotta fold the parachute up every time. Yeah. You pack the chute, and sometimes I don't feel like packing the chute, and then it's like we're only going up. We're only going up to 15,000 feet. Like, you're only in the sky for three minutes. Like, that's dumb. And you can pick the chute. And so what they start doing, they start doing one of two things or sometimes both. One is they start jumping up. They'll, they'll, uh, and uh, there's, there's a, uh, and this is why there's a lot of skydivers in the hacking community. They'll start breaking into buildings. Uh, they'll get up to the roof because usually the roof access is like a simple padlock or something. And, Who's been to the lockpick village? Uh, all of us. And, like, the, yeah, lockpicking is what many of us do on our couch while we're watching TV. It's a great TV hobby because you can sit there. You sit there on the couch with your feet up, and you're watching the TV. Because lockpicking, you can't look. Like, looking doesn't help you. So you're just sitting there watching TV, and you're just just practicing on this lock. And it's, like, I my, in my living room, there's locks all over the coffee tables and stuff. And you just... So these guys will break, break into the roofs of buildings like skyscrapers and they'll jump off them. And, and the thrill is not only the, really the jump, because the jump, it's, you're in the air 23 seconds, like, oh, great, all that work for 23 seconds. The thrill is hide from the cops. Because as soon as you, because as soon as you pop that chute, you are the most noticeable thing around. And everybody's going to call the cops. Be like, there's a guy parachuting. I don't know. He jumped off a building. Uh, uh, so on top of that, guarantee, guaranteed trespasser. Cause there's no, there's no skyscrapers that are like, yeah, you can jump off our skyscraper. Like that doesn't exist. Right. And you had, you got up in the air somehow. And, uh, yeah. So they, and yeah, they try to get you for that and, uh, they'll get you for all kinds of shit. And so the thing is, once you let, you gotta figure out where you're gonna land, uh, out of sight of helicopters and security cameras, where you can stash all your stuff and get the hell out. And so usually what they'll do is they'll jump off skyscrapers that have, uh, very large parking garages attached. And so they'll jump off the skyscraper, land in the parking garage, go down the stairs in the parking garage to where the car is already waiting, stuff all the stuff in their trunk and tear off out of there. Uh, <laughs> I'll guarantee plenty of people try it. I, I, and I, I'll guarantee someone has made it. I mean, there's plenty of stunt jumpers, so, um, there's, uh, I am from Chicago, and so we get that all the time. The other thing that they do, uh, is, is methamphetamine. <laughs> and, and so, because the rush, st they stop being able to get that rush from jumping out of airplanes. And there's not a lot else you can do once jumping out of an airplane is no longer exciting, aside from drugs. And so there's a huge, huge drug problem in the skydiving community because of that. Um, so just like that, like, pen testing can get boring. 
breaking like yeah it's cool like breaking into things initially and there's still exciting parts and though i'll still work 18 hour days because i lost track of time because i was so excited about how deep i was supposed to get in <clears throat> but it's a job like if it was that exciting and fun every day nobody would pay me for it the job would pay like eight bucks an hour other than it's way hard to find pen testers um because you gotta, you have to understand not only theory and, and defensive systems. Uh, you have to have practiced offensive stuff a lot and exploit uh, execution at least, maybe not not necessarily development. Because <clears throat> you're up against those defensive systems, you need to know them inside and out. So if you have a desire to be a pen tester, you need to start in defensive. You need to start in blue team. Um, you need to get in, and in, in like the best place you can learn that is in an enterprise that has just crap loads of network traffic. That's what you want. That's where you cut. That's where you cut your teeth, just buried in that mountain of network traffic. Because like, yeah, like a SOC analyst. SOC analyst. That's what I'm talking. Like when I say analyst, it's usually SOC analyst, junior analyst, uh, SIEM analyst. The, Anytime you see analyst in an infosec position, it's that, and that's that's where you cut your teeth because it's you're just like if you change automotive brakes day after day, you're going to get really good and really fast at them, and you're going to be able to be like just eyeball them and go, that doesn't need to be changed. Those two need to be changed. Uh, I'll change this, but it's going to get worn down in six months because of that. Like like how auto mechanics are really good at that. Um, you're going to get really good at how defensive system works. This, this systems work because in an enterprise with tons of network traffic because you're just going to be inundated. There's going to be too much to do and you're going to do everything from every angle. And then you're going to know how those defensive systems work inside and out. And then you're going to know where their shortcomings are. You're going to discover that while you're working with them. You go, man, it really needs to, to, to cover this area more. Like it's just got this blind spot here and you're going to write a bunch of rules to compensate for that blind spot. But then in the future, when you're working as a pen tester and you come across one of those, you know, they're running one of those, you're going to go, you're going to go, Oh, these things have this total blind spot here. We're going to come at it from this angle. Um, yeah, you absolutely have to know defensive systems in order to be a pen tester. And like pen, becoming a pen tester is really hard because there's, it, there's not enough, there's not enough openings for it for one, because not everybody needs it. Well, not everybody s perceives that they need it. Uh, and two, uh, it's, it's slow work. You, you spend hours and hours and hours doing, accomplishing a single task. Whereas as an analyst, you don't have enough hours in the day and you have more tasks than you could ever imagine. And so you're completing tasks just, screaming through different types of tasks so analysts is a great place to cut your teeth in information security and so so i'm that's that's why i'm focusing towards doing an analyst position because and like i said even if you're not trying to get into an engineering role or act an active security role you know active versus passive um Having the base knowledge of just how this stuff works will help you with all of that because you will be able to communicate your intentions. You'll be able to craft. Make sure they can't turn the camera on for this, I guess. Having a good knowledge of defensive systems will help you as, an, as someone who's just writing security posture for an organization will help you craft a better security posture and it will help you better communicate your intentions to the engineers, the people who are doing this work. Uh, it'll help you communicate it better to all of IT because you'll know how what they do works. And communication is, is more critical than any, than any skill set. Um, we're going to talk about that. Let me see if my 16 by 9 slides work on here. Um, yeah. 
cheeky. This one, this the, the, I keep it a little more professional here, I think. But uh, so what we're going to talk about here is networking, and I mean, I mean face-to-face -face network networking. I mean talking to human beings um, as a means of generating job leads, uh, getting information, help with a problem. That problem might be getting a job, uh, but help with a problem with a certain type of system you work with you can't figure out. Help with setting up your ESX server in your house. Um, we're our own best resource. We as humans are social animals. Um, I understand some of us are extroverts, some of us are introverts. Um, introverts get a lot of bad rap. They get called antisocial. Um, they get picked on a lot by the extroverts, but uh, no, everyone's social. We're a social animal as a human. Um, we need to be around people. Um, everyone has that innate desire to have to have people near them. Uh, it's just introverts. Uh, are, their energy is kind of drained by being around large groups of people or boisterous people, and they need to go back home and read a book and just hang out with themselves for a while to recharge. Whereas extroverts, they pull their opposite. Um, we are, we are we lose our energy by being uh, alone. You know, like reading a book is very draining for me. I like to read. Uh, I'll read a book to go to bed because it's very draining to me to just have no interaction, no social interaction. And I will go out where there are large groups of people to kind of recharge myself. And and so we're just two different types of personalities, but um, we both like being around people. And there's there's and when I'm full and I'm charged, like. I'm done. I don't. I'll get away from that large group of people. I don't need to go decharge. Like, um, we're social animals. We need each other. We rely on each other. It's how we got to where we are as one of the weakest animals on the face of the earth. Yet we dominate it, uh, and it's because we work together really well. And so, and, and now in the age of internet and. Uh, Internet really helps. In the age of computers and technology, where we have so many devices that can do things for us, I really feel like we're starting to lose this. Um, we're starting to lose that understanding that that we're each other's best resource, uh, and it's and I'm seeing it in that <clears throat> people are forgetting how to network. Like this, the old everybody knows the old phrase like it's not what you know, it's who you know. Um, that's becoming. People are saying that in a snide way now. They're saying that, hey, you know, it's not what you know, it's who you know. It's who you paid off or who you, you know, who you slept your way to the top with, they say. Um, and yeah, well, there's a dirty side to it like that. Um, it's not, that's not the entire thing. Um, it is very much uh, who you know. Um, That that is definitely one of their one of their yeah they're they're a resource, and and I really try to drive home like it's not we're not being mean about it we're not we're not like uh, it's let, let me let me network and get to know a bunch of people so that I can use somebody for a job it's not about using people um, we're 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 make we're 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 making. We're, even though it's in a, prof we're talking like in a professional situation here, like like in a conference or information security meetup of some sort. Um, it's it's just about making. It's, it really is about making friends, and it's weird to stand up here and give a talk to people about making friends. Um, but we we're we're really losing that, especially with the internet and with social networking, which you think would be make it easier to make friends, but we're terrible at doing it in person. Um, we're awful face to face. Um, which is really weird, um, yeah. Because, like I say here, like net, like this networking, it's an or, it's this organic process where it's a relationship that you you start small and you cultivate it and it grows, and 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 we're organisms, and yet we're becoming terrible at, at just performing this task, and it's critical. Um, who who is of those of you who are currently employed? Who has their job because of who got their job because of someone they knew, whether it was. Someone gave them a good lead, even. Um, God, that's like perfect for my statistic. <laughs> I, I did the math in my head because it was so close. Um, it's it's like seventy three percent of all Americans have the job they currently have because because of another person, and whether it was that 
that other person directly hired them because they knew each other or because the other person saying, hey, we got an opening in my company, it'd be really good, I'll put in a good word. Um, many, if not most companies, really like to hire based on employee referral. A lot of companies do employee referral programs. Um, the last, last corporation I worked at, I made a killing on employee referrals. That's a great way to pad your wallet. You want some walking around money, get your friends hired uh, if they have that kind of program. And, and just keep an eye on the website and see where all the careers are open because, you know, you might know, you might, to this point, you might have a buddy who's in marketing and you met him somewhere and you're like, well, probably not going to be a great resource. I don't do marketing. It's an all right guy. Um, but then you see, you know, there's a marketing opening and you know he's looking to get out of the company he's at. You go, hey, why don't you apply for this job? You tack your name on it. You made you made two grand off your company, <laughs> and so that's that's you know more of the top bullet point. But you helped him out. You got him a job. You get to work with a guy you like, at least in the building. Um, so like, there's there's more to it than just like how can I use these people to get a job and then never talk to him again. Um, also, being being a source of talent is a great way to market yourself in a networking fashion. If you know a lot of people who do a lot of things, you'll be in a situation and someone will bring it up, you know, like we're having really trouble finding a guy that knows something about this or we need to bring somebody in for this project, but like we're getting no leads. You can go, I know a guy. Hey, I know a guy. Let me get you in touch with them. You put them in touch. Guy A and guy B are both happy uh, and they're both happy with you. And now you're building that relationship. Like you're a great source for these things. And people, and a large part of this is just staying in people's minds, um, keeping these relationships going. Um, and that's a really hard part of it. That's, that's the upside of where social networking, at least, uh, has been nice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, absolutely not. Oh, mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's a uh, um a lot of us call ourselves hackers um these days, which is interesting because back in the day we were all afraid to call ourselves hackers and not for a legal reason uh because we had such respect for these serious crazy underground people who were doing the legitimate crazy stuff that you would go no those guys are those are the hackers those i'm just i'm just playing with i'm just writing exploits for aol like i'm not a hacker i'm like i'm just writing some code like i'm just a programmer i just like to play with aol like those guys are the hackers uh and so like it's really weird to call myself a hacker because i just think back to that i was like you don't because like on irc in the day if you called yourself a hacker like you would get you would immediately have to prove a lot of stuff or you would you were in trouble you had to go buy a new computer. <laughs> you just put it right in the garbage. <laughs> yeah, and and nowadays, um, information security. Uh, we're um, there's so few of us, and we're so passionate. We're so passionate, and and we get so excited when somebody else just knows what we're talking about because there's so few of us, and a lot of us get too passionate. And I'll talk about that later. Um, that, that we're just so happy that you at least know four of the words of the last 12 that I said. And I'm going to keep talking to you. And I hope you come back because you know what I'm saying. <laughs> and we just want to be friends. Cause, yeah, cause it's lonely talking to her. Cause, yeah, and I have a lot of bad ideas. <laughs> and there's no one there to go, don't do that. Um, yeah, we're a super friendly community. There's a, yeah, there's a lot of other business computers, communities that are very cutthroat, very like sales, like there's too many salespeople. They're all st stepping on each other's backs. So yeah, there's, there's, you guys are lucky that this is what you're interested in. Yet another thing to like get out of your own way and stop telling yourself you're not good enough, you're not going to do it, and you don't have any certifications or whatever. Um, we're a really open, welcoming community. There's not enough people to fill these jobs. Um, we're doing everything we can. I'm doing everything I can as a person who hires people to try and get you in. Don't get in your way. They keep in mind, like that's, that's what we're talking about. The opportunity's there. 
The opportunity is there even like if you have a very limited skill set. You're going to have to build up a little bit. It's going to take some practice. It might take you 12, 18, 24 months. Shouldn't take you more than that to get an InfoSec job, um, especially with how fast it's exploding. That, that my estimate there will decrease exponentially year over year uh, to the point where uh, I suspect we may see $8 an hour analyst jobs in five years or so, but I hope not. So get in now. That's the other argument is that, like, no, it's, it, it's, it's not going to shrink down. We're going to keep needing more. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a good argument on the same side of it from a different area saying, no, it's going to grow because it's going to keep growing. We're going to keep needing more. We're going to keep staying in this negative unemployment because there's so many more things coming out. People are connecting to the, their lands that, yeah. I mean, I do Internet of Things stuff now, just not in people's. You know, I don't do your connected thermostat stuff. Um, I do uh, connected power grid stuff. Like, Internet of Things is not new. The term is new, and it's garbage because it doesn't even make sense. Um, it's a marketing term. Any stuff like that here is marketing term. Red team, blue team, gray hat, black. That's all marketing garbage. Right. It's And it's all extremes, and generally all extremes are wrong, and the truth is somewhere in between. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh man, <laughs> this is this is. Uh, anybody know Leslie Carhart? She goes by Hacks for Pancakes on Twitter. Great, really good friend, really good friend of mine. Um, I, I uh, I'm gonna call her out in my head. I call her my infosec therapist because whenever I'm gonna freak out, I'll send her a text. And uh, I, I freaked out a while ago, and I texted her, and I said, like, I feel like, um, like I have a problem with, like, tourism. I call it tourism in the industry. So people are showing up because they heard it's cool. I'm going to go check it out. You know, like, just tourists. Like, oh, Paris is really cool. Let's go to Paris. And then you go to Paris, and just full of these garbage American tourists. Um, just throwing their garbage on everything, just being terrible and going, man, Paris used to be cool. Um I have this huge worry about that. And it is happening. Uh, and it's happening at the conferences, and that's what, like, sets me off. Because these conferences, used to be, there used to be, like, two of them, for one. That was it. And they used to be scary as hell. <laughs> they used to be sketchy. And per I personally miss it. But um, it was also not super welcoming. Um, I really like how friendly everybody's got. And so, like, I, I was like, I feel like I'm encouraging tourism by doing these talks and these trainings. Like, I'm saying, like, hey, man, you think InfoSec's cool? You want a job? Come on in. Just open the door. You can have a job, and you can have a job. You can have a job. And um, and Leslie goes, they quite, I, I said, do you, th you think I'm just letting a bunch of tourists in? And she goes, that's not even a, a – the question's not valid. Because um, – Sure, maybe a small percentage of people who listen to my talks are doing it because of that, but they'll get filtered out right away. And she goes, because there's people like you and me who are doing the interviewing, and they're not going to get past us. There's no way you can you can spot a tourist a mile away because they don't care. You can like you can you can spot passion in anybody. We all can. We we you as a human being can identify when someone is passionate about something. Uh, and you can identify when they're just ticking a box or doing a job or just aren't, just aren't passionate. And we as the people who do the hiring only want passionate people because you could, you could teach a chimpanzee some of this stuff, some of the skill stuff. You know, I could teach anyone how to do anything. Everything in the last talk, I, I could teach all of you that. Sit down one on one, in a, in a relatively short period of time compared to how long a career is. 
I could teach you how to read, you know, how to use Splunk. Um, I can't teach you to have passion. You cannot teach a person passion. You cannot force someone to care about something. In fact, the more you try, the less they're probably going to care about it. Um, the greatest social engineer cannot enforce passion on somebody. You can get temporary interest, but you wait a week and it's gone. You cannot, the passion is just inherent. And so, um, if you don't have that passion, and for whatever part of Info, InfoSec it is, and I understand it's a wide realm, as long as you care about what you're getting into, we'll spot that and we'll go, yeah, that's who we want. And, and you ask anyone who does hiring, you, you can go out there and vet what I'm telling you. I tell you, we just, we, we, we want passionate people. Cause like when you, you start a new job, you don't know how to do that job. You don't take a job you already know how to do every last aspect of. You can't because at one, it's a different company with a different infrastructure. It's, you hit, like you start any, especially in IT, you start a new company. Your first year is spent just really getting a hold of how this whole IT infrastructure works at this place. Um, even if it's a lateral move, even if I was a Windows admin here and then I went here to be a Windows admin, that's going to be a year of just learning infrastructure. Um, generally, you don't do lateral moves. You move up. And um, we have this thing we call imposter syndrome where we all worry that we're going to get found out. Someone's going to find out I don't know as much as they think I know, and then we're all in trouble. Um, and uh, that's, that's not true. Because um, like, when you take a new job, you're taking a new job that, where you're going to add more skills. It's going to be doing more than you were at your last job, but it's going to be for more money and a bigger company or whatever. And there's going to be, it's going to be more involved. And they ask you, you think, well, I noticed you haven't done this before. You think that's, you can handle that, you know, in some more specific sense. And you're going to go in the interview like, yeah, I'm really interested in that. I'd definitely like to get into it. And they're going to go, okay, well, come on and do that. Like, where's the imposter part? Everybody in that room just agreed that like, yeah, you don't know it, but you're going to do it anyway and figure it out. And like, no, like rarely has anyone taken a job that they already knew how to do. So get out of your own way. You're not an imposter. It's just what you, you, you're taking a job that has more responsibility for more money as you move up because you're doing more, which means by definition, you haven't, you weren't doing it before, which means you're going to have to figure it out. And you could read a book on it, but there's nothing like doing it. So, so don't, just be honest in the interview. Be passionate. Don't be afraid to show that passion. Be open, and uh, and they'll see it. Um, in the interviews, like we 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 tend to really stiffen up. You know, maybe I'll talk that later during the resume. But like, we try to be super professional. And, oh yes, sir. Oh no, sir. Uh, yes, it sounds excellent. Definitely feel like I can I can pull that off for you guys. Feel like I'm going to be a great asset to this company. Um. That's creepy as heck. That's weird. I hate that. And, and so like one of the, and, and I understand you're nervous and you're just trying to not make any mistakes. Um, so like when I do interviews, I, the, the first, really three quarters of the time is spent loosening the person up. It's all social engineering. It's all an interview is. It's not an assessment of your, it's, it's not an assessment of your skills. Cause all you're going to do is repeat to me what's on your resume. <coughs> maybe at length, uh, and I can teach you skills. I don't care. I want to know who you are as a person. Do you really give a crap about what, about the job you're applying for, uh, or are you just broke and desperate for any job anyone will give to you? And unfortunately, I generally don't hire, hire those people because they don't have the passion. And I, I understand, like, you need, like, being unemployed hurts. I was unemployed. I was homeless. Um, but I look for passion because, you know, you, you throw a guy a bone just because he needs a few bucks and he's not going to care about the job, but that person who cares about the job, they're going to work their butt off for you. Uh, they're going to work 18 hour days because they love it and you're not going to feel bad about it. I mean, and you're going to tell them not to. You're going to go, dude, stop. You're, I, I'm not paying you enough for it because I care. I'm going, you can't do this. I've had to do that so many times with so many teams. Like, man, just, Go outside. Go outside. Yeah, I'll give people comp days. Who just just stay home. Hang out with your dog. Just put the computer away. Um, 
And that's what I want is those passionate people. Not because I get, I get my money's worth because they crank out 18 hours a day. And there's, I'm sure there's guys who think that. But um, because you get so much better quality of work out of someone who cares. And so three quarters of it is just me loosening them up and seeing who they are as a person. And not just, not just to make sure they actually have a passion for what's going on, but also to make sure they're going to fit in with the team. Make sure that they're going to click with the guys I got already that are on the team. Because we're, we're quirky people, especially us InfoSec people. We're weird guys. And, and we don't get along with everybody. Nobody gets along with everybody. And don't, and don't worry about that. Don't go in an interview trying to make everyone like you. Everyone knows that person who tries to make everyone like them. Who just tries to say what they think? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. I shouldn't have laughed because I called you out. Um, everyone knows that person who just tries to say what they think everybody wants to hear. That's being an imposter because you're saying a lot of things that, that uh, aren't true to how you actually feel. You know, and 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 yeah, like. We all do it in social situations. Like if somebody's saying something that's very offensive to us, but you're not, you don't want to get into this fight. You'll go, sure, yeah, okay, and then you'll change the topic or walk away or you know, use the restroom. Um, um, like I'm not saying we're being malicious and trying, but I mean, we kind of are. Like we're trying to finagle our way into this job that we really want. Don't do it. We can spot it, just like you can spot it, and somebody doing it to you. You're not unique. We can all spot it. Uh, you're not fooling anybody in that interview. You're definitely not fooling anybody in that interview because you're nervous. You're sweating already. Your brain's going a million miles an hour, and you think you're going to pull off some massive social engineering stunt? Get out. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not nervous. I have a job. <laughs> I'm, 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 I got my feet up in that chair. You're, you're trying to impress me. Like, I'm not nervous at all. Uh, I'm thinking straight. I'm thinking of a lot of other things besides the question that I asked you. I'm watching your response and not for what the technical answer is, but for how you came to that technical answer. I'm watching for if you said, I don't know, uh, or if you, per if you looked like you weren't sure and you said no. I'm looking for that. I'm looking for how you said, I don't know. I'm looking for if you said, I don't know. Uh, but I'd probably check with here or here, or I think it's this, but I would Jeff def definitely check here or here before uh, I made a hard call on that. They just give you like five different ways of answering the same question, and and in in the same way, more or less. And like that's what I'm looking for. See what kind of person you are. That's what an interview is. It's not an assessment of your skills. That's uh, that's another magician's trick I've revealed for you. That's one of the interviews. Don't, interviewers don't tell you. And there's bad interviewers who don't do that, who think it really is just, I'm going to ask you some skills questions, and if you get, uh, if you score 70% or higher, I give you a job. Like, that's terrible. And then you, you have garbage teams, and don't work for those companies because their teams are garbage because their people don't care. Probably. At the very least, you know the management's garbage. Is that the kind of manager you want to work for? Like, when you're in that interview, get a feel for the dude who's interviewing you. Um, do you want to work for him? That was something I was going to ask you earlier, because you said you're losing a lot of guys that could have been in the sense that you know, you feel it's better than Did I say that in here, or did I say that outside of here? <laughs> I talk a lot. <laughs> okay. It's, it is something I have said, yeah. Do you feel it's better to work on getting IT guys in management, IT positions, versus the old? Management. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, one hundred percent. Yeah. Right. Uh, great example. Last last corporation I worked for, uh, we got bought up by another corporation. My current vice president uh, was let go as part of the merger because we didn't need two. Because uh, when you have a merger, you have two or more of everything, and they go. Um, yeah. So they let him go, which is unfortunate because he had a lifetime of infosec career just straight up infosec he was amazing and he was a great guy and he he loved us he loved us he cared about us he would
Yeah. Are you still going? It was till one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Every person I've ever known or loved was outside that door going, you go to lunch? <laughs> it goes to one. Oh, it goes to one. Literally, there's just this ocean of friends. Bye. Yeah, so, so he, he loved us, and uh, they let him go in favor of a guy who, uh, he was like a retail manager and moved into like director of operations for the company, and then uh, they needed some manager in InfoSec, so they just put him in there because he's because they liked him, and he was just the worst. And then, uh, yeah, they were hanging out outside the door, like waiting for. They're probably waiting for me. Yeah, me, all of us. Let's all go. <laughs> um, yeah, and that was terrible. That was terrible how they did that. So yeah. Um, I'm going to skip through a lot of this because I covered a lot of it already. Because I just like, like I told you, it's like stream of consciousness, consciousness, and you'll see I'll step on my own toes and step on my own slides a lot. Um, so, um, man, I can tell already. So, so that's me. Um, <laughs> yeah, little nerdy kid. Um, thought I was cool. Dyed my hair black, even though my hair's already black. <laughs> All kinds of piercings, but then like, I mean, ill-fitting shirt. <laughs> Wrong tie for the shirt. What is that? That? That's just Windows. It's, it's, I'm sure that's Windows 98 back then. Um, like, I get a, I put this up because I get a lot of crap because I'll, I'll talk about this stuff and go, oh yeah, well like here's, here's the uh, good looking, well dressed, uh, guy who's perfect in any social situation telling us to like, just go talk to people. It's really easy. And, and uh, I'm like, no. Right. And it's, and, and that, and that's, this is, this is exactly my point is, is being sociable and being great with people takes practice. Like it's not an easy thing. It was not an easy thing for me. Um, this was me trying my best. This was my best effort. And not to make fun of someone who looks like me. <laughs> um, but, but that was like, I was like somebody, my, I got, this is my first management job and I was like 24. And they told me I had to wear a tie. And so that was what I thought. I was like, well, that means you have to get a collared shirt. And this one doesn't fall off me, so I guess it fits okay. And um, I had, you know, I suffered from agoraphobia. Uh, I, I couldn't, aside from work for whatever reason, I couldn't be outside of my house for more than about an hour. Um, I would start freaking out, having anxiety attacks. I would be at a fun party with lots of friends, and I go, "All right, guy, guys, uh, guys, I gotta get going. I got I guess I'll see you later." And then I'd go home and I'd do nothing. I'd sit at home and I'd worry about what everyone was doing, even though they're <laughs> going to go look at them. Um, yeah, I mean, and uh, I mean, you're going to be judged on your appearance. Unfortunately, um, it's an inconvenient truth of the society we live in, and we all can say that's garbage and you shouldn't do that. And I don't do that, but we all do it, and um, we all. Uh, we all don't just instantly come out of the, roll out of bed and look amazing. Um, I have adult acne that I struggle with. Like when I was in high school, my sophomore health teacher said, "Oh, you're, you're stop having acne on your 18th birthday. And this is the end of puberty, and you're done." And like, why am I still buying Clearasil? I'm like 36. <coughs> um, I have severe scoliosis. Some of you may have noticed I stand a little weird. I'm, I look I look like I'm standing cockeyed, and I'm not. <laughs> I have a few, like if I stand up straight, you can see there's one shoulder that's lower than the other. Um, yeah, my spine is all, I look weird without a shirt on. <laughs> um, um, because of that and because I'm just tall and skinny, clothes don't fit me. It's really hard to buy clothes that fit. I, have, I recently started have, tailoring things a lot, which is amazing. <laughs> no, tailoring, tailoring is cheap. To get a whole three-piece suit tailored, it's like $35, $40. But nobody does it because we think it's expensive and we think it's for fancy people when it's like, no, 
people just make garbage clothes now that need to be tailored. Um, um, I'll walk through this real quick. Uh, even though I, I talked about a half, uh, some of it. So uh, my first real like IT working in an IT company job I got through a friend that I made while I was working in that retail store. He was actually one of my techs. Uh, he was uh, my lead tech. We got to be good friends. And he left to go get a job somewhere else because he wants to work in retail forever. And I was like, man, get me out of here. And he got me out of there. Um, even though my only skill set was I can build a computer, um, he got me a job working in an IT department, you know, doing, anyway. Um, first InfoSec job I got um, was through a friend of mine I met at a monthly board game night that I would go to. And I didn't know what he did for a living, and that was my fault um, for not being more communicative with. And so, the, and this, this, is the, I use this as a great example. I'm not talking about just networking at infosec cons and meetups. I mean, everywhere you go, where there's other people, that's a potential useful person. And please, and don't take that the wrong way. It's a potential, but it is a potentially useful person. Here was this guy I'd known for like eight months meeting him every month, playing board games with him, hanging out, great guy, we were friends, we had fun, we liked each other. He shoots my roommate an email one day and says, you know anyone who's interested in getting an information security? We cannot find anybody. We've been trying for a year and a half to fill this junior admin role, or this junior engineer role. You just know anybody, just shot in the dark. My roommate goes, yeah, Johnny. You know Johnny, play board games, the board game Johnny. And it was, it was like that day, it was a board game night. He was like, really? Johnny never brought it up. And then I went to the board game night that night, and I'm like, I'm that Johnny from the emails you guys. <laughs> like, I, I've been looking to get an infosec for like, oh, like, we just never talked about it. And that was my bad for not just, what do you do for a living? Oh, cool. Like, just learning that it's a, usually a basic thing you learn about people. And he was like, yeah. And they, he's brought me in for an interview. And there were three guys up for that job, two of which were far, far more skill-wise qualified for that job, like hands down. Like I got every skill question wrong, <laughs> like every one of them. Was... And they told me this like a year and a half later. <laughs> like, dude, you, we, 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 we kind of still make fun of that interview. And I said, what did you guys even pick me? He goes, because we liked you. Because you really, you, you, you had that passion. Like you had the passion that we do, and and uh, and you and we felt like you'd really click with the team, and we knew like whatever, whatever you need to learn, you'll learn. Like who cares? But we because we liked you, and I saw my got my infosec job with no information security experience, playing board games with a guy, and um, yeah, the guy, the friend who got me the job at Red Leg. Um, senior consultant is my position, but we're, we're, we're building the pen testing team. Um, there's only two of us. They hired him to start building out a pen testing offering for the company and said, let's hire someone to help you. And he said, no, you should call Johnny. Um, I'd seen him about five times in my life. I knew him on the internet. <laughs> I met him at some infosec con somewhere. We hit it off. We clicked really well. And we'll talk to each other a lot and ask each other questions about weird situations. Like, hey, have you ever worked with this? And so when the position opened up, he's like, oh, I heard Johnny's job's about to be up. Let's, let's get him in here. Johnny's awesome. He's, I'd love to work with him. And that's, it wasn't, it was not at all skills based. My interview for there was me telling them that I, all the things I don't know. Um, because he was like, well, you know, uh, we don't, I, I don't have a lot of windows. Backend knowledge, how's your windows for pen testing? And I'm like, oh, I got zero. I was just honest. Like, oh, pff, I don't, I'm all Linux, man. Oh, yeah, me too. Um, and then uh, I told them I wanted to do a bunch of stuff that they weren't currently doing yet. <laughs> it was like, I was like, skills wise, the worst candidate for the position. But we worked so well together. We liked, you know, he, the, in, not just him and I, but the other people on the call. They're like, all right, get him in here, sort it out later. It's a very emotional process, and we, we, and it's it's not logical, at all. It's emotional, and so logically, we'll get in our own way and be like, "I don't have the skills for this. I'm not even going to apply. I'm not." No, it's not. It, 
It's not your job to determine if you're right for the position. Write that down. Get that tattooed on yourself. It's not your job to determine if you're the right person for a position. It's the person interviewing you. Don't do their job for them. They're not paying you. Go in there. Apply. Apply and go in there. Let them figure it out. It might be that HR wrote up a really crappy description of what the job even was. And it's something you can actually do. Go. Do it. Um, try to get a better slide view here. Uh, uh, um, so, I'm going to talk about a lot of inconvenient truths. Um, Woody Allen said that um, 80% of life is showing up. We all know the quote. We don't know it's Woody Allen, but we know the quote. Eighty percent of life is just showing up. We don't put a lot of thought into what that means. Um, we, some of us think it's funny. Like, what's the other twenty percent just sleeping? Like, we don't, like it's, it sounds like a funny, quirky joke or like a one-liner, um, but it's true. Eighty um, percent of your life happened to you. The, the events in your life, something you would call a significant occurrence of some sort, happened to you because you were there. Because you weren't, you weren't sitting on your couch, you weren't lying in bed. So you're outside somewhere doing something, and whether it was in a coffee shop or a board game night, um, it happened because you were there. You, you're, you see a lot of people who are luckier, luckier than you, who are in places you'd like to be in, job roles you wish you had, but you're like, yeah. And they're like, yo, you're on the same level as 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 uh, Marlene. Like you could totally. You should get a job like her. And you go, ah, she got that job. She was in the right place at the right time. That's all that was. She just met this guy who worked there, and uh, they kind of hit it off. And he's like, oh, he'd be really good on my team. And he hired her. It was just a right place at the right time. One, that's everything I just told you. Like, that's how it works. <laughs> Most of you have the job you have because of, because uh, you knew somebody. Um, <clears throat> B, Yeah, it was the right place at the right time. Um, and yeah, it was, it was the people we meet in our daily lives is completely coincidental that we come across them. And that's life. Life is serendipity. Um, but that's how it works. And so what can you do to make that happen more often? What can you do to increase your luck to make sure that more things happen at the right place at the right time? Um, that you, you, you show up. Uh, you go to things. <laughs> you leave the house. It, it statistically, um, you, like when somebody asks you to do, do something, and you don't have it in your personal. Who here keeps a personal calendar, by the way? Anybody? Personal calendar for your personal life. Yeah, most people don't. I'm surprised by that, um, given how hectic life just is in general, just living. Yeah. You, like, a lot of people still have, like, the calendar at home, like, on the fridge when you write in, like, if you have a wedding coming up. You know. um, but I get asked if I want to do a lot of stuff, and uh, I'll look at my calendar, and if I'm not doing anything that day, I'll say yes. Oh, well, I'm not doing anything that day, or, you know, I, I don't have anything in that block. Yeah. Cool, let's do it. Um. And that was the thing, that was how I first started getting out of my social anxiety, was forcing myself to do things, and that was my rule. If there's nothing in that square, now there is. And you have to go do it. And um, sometimes it's going to suck. You're going to end up, you, I mean, generally weddings you usually have to go to. But uh, meet a lot of people at weddings. You're eating dinner at a bunch, with a bunch of strangers at a table. I come across someone. Um, but most of the time, you're not. Uh, and one statistic I read that proved really true that like the masters of the social, these, you know, the industry established masters of the social situation all, all agree. You're only going to have about a 20% success ratio with going out and ending up with someone useful that you picked up. And I'm paraphrasing a lot of things, but they say one in five 
one in five people you meet, uh, and that's best case scenario. So don't get discouraged. Like one in five, that's 20%, that's low. And they're like, in our experience as people who have written books and books and books on this topic, one in five is the best you're going to be able to do just as far as how human nature works. So if you're hitting one in five, if you're only getting about a 20% of the people you meet end up being something, someone that you kind of hit it off with and established some sort of rapport with, you are a master. Uh, and so the way you meet the most people is you go out and you say yes to everything. You go do things. You meet people in the craziest places. This is how you get in the right place at the right time. It's just statistics. It's just math. The more places you show up to, the greater your chances of being in that right place at the right time. Because the right place at the right time is never, never while you're home alone watching Orange is the New Black or whatever. I know just the new season started. <laughs> and uh, I'm excited. Um, yeah, because strangers don't walk past your couch. Uh, in any in any positive context, <laughs> if I mean when they do this, yeah. you generally don't hit it off. You don't. You're not. You're probably not going to be pals. Yeah, this it's an off. It's police officer. It's a burglar, axe murderer. You're generally like they're there on business. Is my point. They they're, they're in the middle of something. Um, <clears throat> they're not waking you up. When you went to bed early on Friday because you just had a long day and like you you called up and like yeah I'm not gonna make it to that I'm not gonna get to the that outing with you guys then I got a lot of work to do but really you're just tired and you're gonna go to bed early like you gotta go you gotta get out there um, it's 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 hard it's work it sounds like work because it's work you have to practice at it that was like the first thing I said when we walked in here. It's something, it's, it's hard at first, but once you start doing it, once you set rules for yourself, like if I put it in that calendar, I have to go. Um, like I understand we have families and kids and like there's things that have to take priority. There's certain situations where you can use an excuse, but like if you got no excuse, like I'm tired is not an excuse. Um, you have to go. Um, and then you have to go be sociable. You can't go in and sit in the corner and wait until it's over and then go home because you just might as well just stayed home. Um, it's a it's it's a skill. You're changing your personality. It's and and now it's not a big thing to me. Now it's habit because I've done it enough. Um, but just making sure my watch was still working. Um, yeah, and then when you meet when you meet people that you don't like that you don't click with. People that seem abrasive or just, just for whatever reason, you can't put your finger on it. You can't, you're just like, ah, I don't talk to this guy anymore. Um, don't, don't burn that bridge. Don't do anything to insult or offend them. Um, chances are you had just hadn't found that thing, that level you guys clicked on yet. And I, I cannot stress that enough. I cannot stress how often I found that to true, to be true. How many people have written off? That I've run into multiple times at information security meetups and stuff. Or I go to a lot of non-infosec stuff too, and I go, oh, yeah, this, "This guy's here again. This guy always wants to talk to me, and he's got nothing to say." And then something will come up, and he'll click on something, or he'll talk about something you didn't realize he did that you're really interested in, and then he start talking. And then it turns out he's really cool. It was just like initially, you didn't like what he's talking about, and you wrote him off as just like you know, like ah, this guy doesn't have nothing. He's got nothing going on. Um, that happens to me all the time. I'll run into somebody a fourth, fifth, sixth time. Uh, and then we'll just hit on some conversation. And then it turns out they're really cool. Or, or they're really abrasive people initially. And you go, man, that guy's a jerk. I like talking to him. Yeah. I'm like, and then maybe they're kind of a jerk. We're all kind of jerks sometimes. Maybe he was just kind of a jerk that day. But then you hit on a topic, and sometimes you got to break them down. They're kind of a jerk because they don't really want, because you're the pud. They don't really want to talk to you. You got nothing going on, nothing of interest to them. And then I had it happen to me last night, and I'm not going to say with who. Um, I had on a motorcycle chain bracelet 
really cool motorcycle chain bracelet. This guy is always kind of, kind of been kind of a jerk. And, and not that he's a jerk, just more curt. Kind of curt with me. I understand he's very busy. There's a lot going on and I don't have anything to offer in that situation. But saw the bracelet and asked about it. We made some jokes. I made a joke about it. We were laughing and then it turns out he's big into motorcycles. I'm big into motorcycles. Start talking about motorcycles. And then so he goes, so what do you do for a living anyway? Because he had written me off as just some like, he had written me off as a tourist. And he's been in the scene a long time. Uh, and what do you do for a living anyway? And I tell him like, well, I'm just a you know, pen tester, but uh, first I go, oh, I do InfoSec. And he's like, I should punch you right now. <laughs> like, that's the worst answer. I go, oh, I'm a pen tester, uh, but I focus mainly on electronics, black boxing, and I went a little more detail because I knew who he was. And he was like, oh, cool, yeah, like, We've been looking into getting into that, like this and that. And I'm like, yeah, and we had this report. And like, now when he walks walks by, he goes, hey, man, I get a high five. When I could have just written him off as a jerk, made some snide remark to him and walked away. Um, but he's a fairly important person. And now he high fives me when we walk past. <laughs> just wait it out. You're probably just having fun, having fun that zone you click on. Don't burn your bridges. Do not burn your bridges. Do not make snide remarks to people you don't like. Do not talk, do not say bad things about them to other people who know them. Just wait it out. Just go, eh, you know, sometimes we don't click. It's okay. Because chances are you probably will eventually. Um, so like once, once you actually show up, and I might end it here, um, once you actually show up, you gotta work the room. You can't sit in the corner. I see this all the time, the wallflowers. Um, put your phone, put your stuff away. And I mean put your phone, turn, you know, turn it off or put it on vibrate, put it in your pocket. Uh, I prefer you turn turn the notifications off or put it in airplane mode because if it's in your pocket and it's constantly buzzing, um, one, it's going to distract you from conversation. Two, instinctively, your phone buzzes. Even if you're in conversation, you're going to like, how many times have you guys seen this? Sorry. And they put it away and say, oh, sorry. It was work, sorry. I don't, don't put it away. I don't care if you said sorry. It's irritating. Don't do it. Um, it's bad for you. It takes you out of the conversation. It takes you out of the zone. And you have to mentally start over with a rapport you might be building that you don't even know you're building. But mentally, you're starting over now because you were distracted. It's like when you get, if you, those people leave their email client open at work, and every time it dings, you stop what you're doing and you look at the email. And you go back to what you're doing, and you're like, oh, where was I? Oh yeah, now you, and you get 300 emails a day. That's 300 five-second periods you've lost. Um, and 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 you got to get up and walk around. <clears throat> you can't have your phone away and just sit in a chair and wait for people to talk to you, because that guy's creepy. You're not gonna go talk like people aren't. You're not gonna go walk up to that guy who's just sitting there in a chair, like just sitting there. It's just. You gotta get up, move around. Somebody's, um, generally strangers don't co start conversations with strangers one on one. That's a real rare, real, real rare, it's a real rare thing. We don't do it. Um, unless we feel bad for someone. Someone looks really lonely. You know, like, oh, here's, we're in this meetup and this guy's just by himself. All right, I guess I'll go say something. And only if you're that kind of person. Oh, I'm that kind of person. I didn't used to be. I trained myself to be that kind of person. I practiced a lot. I would make myself go talk to the strangers to get better at just being more comfortable with being social and socializing. Because that's all this is. I mean, we're talking about like networking and like power business and getting jobs. And it's like <laughs> all it really is is just being a human being. Just, just making friends. Just being nice to people. Not even making friends. It's just about just being nice to everybody. What a bizarre concept. Um, but you have to actively do it. Um, when you're walking around, um, just find your happy place common. It's funny. Um, when you're walking around, a lot of us, we have a lot in our minds. And sometimes we're concerned or we're stressed out or we're frustrated or we're angry or we're worried. That shows up in your face immediately. A lot of us are tired. We're just tired. Life makes you tired. I know. I really do. Um, but it's on your face, especially if it's, it's a meetup, an 8 o'clock, an 8 p.m. meetup on a Friday night when you worked all day. Now it just starts at 8 p.m. and you're just like, 
You're just tired. You look like this. I'm tired. I don't look horrible. I don't look off-putting, but I'm like, I'm, I could look better. Um, I have a happy place. And I tell everyone, find your happy place. And your happy place is different for everyone. And I think I got this from Peter Pan. If, if somebody can call me out or they remember. Is it Happy Gilmore? Oh, yeah. When he's, yeah. And, it, and, it's, and it, yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's Happy Gilmore. How did I, how did I forget happy place is Happy Gilmore? <laughs> I'm tired. Um, so your happy place is just like Happy Gilmore. It was his grandma watering the flowers in her mansion garden. Like, whatever you're, just that happy memory or whatever you have that always makes you just like chuckle a little. You're like, just whatever. Huh? Oh, you should have plenty. We like to think we don't. They're there. Just get out of your own way. You got plenty. Um, just something that puts that, that always puts that smirk, that dumb smirk on your face. That happy, that happy place. I'm watching like seven of you do it right now, and you don't know you're doing it. Yeah, it's that. It, yeah. That, that happy place. Remember that, that random smirk when you know, when you realize you just did it and you look like an idiot. You don't look like an idiot. You look like an idiot when you're with a group of friends and you're just looking this way and smiling. And then, and then that's when we're like, oh, I'm going to And they call you out like, what are you, what are you, what happened? Um, I wish I could have taken a picture of all of you smiling. I'm not going to do that to you. But, uh, yeah, you're all doing it. That, that place. And when you get out and you walk around, just think of that and then give it a second and you'll, you'll mellow out a bit. <laughs> And, you just, and, and But you'll open your eyes, and you'll get a little bit of a smile, and you're walking around, and at least, at least you got that. And you're more approachable. You don't look so weird. Your guy is just checking the place out, that clearly doesn't know anybody, uh, looking around, but like, you don't look weird. You don't look tired, you don't look angry, you don't look unapproachable. You look like somebody, if I did approach you, if you did approach me, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be weirded out by it. Like if you came up to someone like that, and then said, "Hey, how you doing? I'm John." Perfectly normal situation. Um, that that and that's a psychological thing. I, that that was the breakdown I had did from a lot of reading. Like, just that. Just find your happy place. When you have your eyes open, you have a little bit of a smile. People instantly trust you more. Find you much less of a threat. Um. I know it's really hard to approach a stranger one-on-one. -on -one. That was an advanced technique for me. Um, so for beginners, what I recommend is finding the largest group of people uh, and just pop in with them. Because generally, if it's a real large group of people who are just hanging out, um, especially places like this, chances are some of them in that group are also new and did, just did exactly what I told you to use. And like, just seeing what's going on here is not a weird concept. Like, here's a group of people. I like, can see what was going on around here. Like, as soon as you show up, they know what you're doing. Like, oh, it's a group of people. He's just seeing if there's something going on. There's not, though, and he'll, he'll get bored and leave. Um, but maybe he won't. Maybe they're talking about something interesting. Um, don't immediately bust into conversations. Um, Unless you have something like incredibly pertinent. Uh, that's, that's an intermediate advanced technique. And don't bust into conversations. Wait for like a lull. Don't, like, don't interrupt people who have already been talking when you just showed up and then you show up and be like, oh yeah! Don't be that guy. He's creepy. Um, uh, wait for a lull. You know, every, when a bunch of people are talking about stuff, every now and then there's that, that dip of nobody has something to say. That's when you can jump in. If you have something related, that somebody else didn't cover already. Um, you can usually jump in, with usually a, a quick story about something that happened to you personally related to that, that adds to the conversation is a great one. Um, stories are great. Stories are how we communicate. Stories are a great way to get people to like you really, really, really fast uh, because it's how we evolved. We've only been writing for, what, seven, 7,000 years? We, like, we know that's not long enough for evolution to have kicked in. Um, how did we, how do we transfer information before writing? We told stories. We know that. All the tribes passed stories down from generation to generation. Um, and like when, like 
Even when your grandpa's telling you a boring old story about how he used to tie an onion to his belt and, uh, you know, go down to the store. Like, you still listen, you still have like a, a, a vague interest in that. Uh, and it's because it, it's part of our brain. We evolved that. That part of our brain has evolved to be, as soon as somebody's telling a story, you're more, you're more open to perceiving what's going on with that story. You connect way better when it, if I told you a fact about me versus telling you a story that implied a fact about me, this, the, you would immediately forget the fact, but you would remember the fact on the story side. Like if I just told you a sentence, three months later you've forgotten. But if I told you a story, three months later, more often than not, the person actually goes, oh yeah, he had that story about. He or he's that guy who likes. But if I just said, I like Coke, three months later, you know, you remember, I like Coke. And, sh and that's just how our brains are. So share stories rather than say, uh, I really like those. Like, share a quick, quick story, uh, which I'm terrible at. I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, people love stories about failure. Here's that failure theme again. Uh, completely different context. Scheidenfreude. Um, we love hearing people fail because it makes us feel better about ourselves because we didn't fail. And not so much that. It makes us feel like this person's at least not better than us. It puts you, you on the same level as them. So even if you came out, especially me, like, I, I dress like this a lot normally. And so, like, when I approach people or I approach a group, like, I'm, it's already, I'm, I'm coming in hot. <laughs> like, I understand that. Um, and seriously, here's this guy who's, and it's not like, uh, sometimes it's, this guy thinks he's better than us. A lot of times it's, I do think he's better than me. Because we judge, we unconsciously judge people based on their appearance. Um, and so when somebody who you're kind of like, oh, this guy's more important than me or whatever, shares a story about failure, kind of puts them back on that same level, and you're more comfortable with them, and you'll interact better with them. And when you interact better with them, they'll interact better with you. Now your pals. Long story short. Um, and then finally they're like, match the energy of the group. Um, don't come in hot. <laughs> like if a group is just kind of hanging out, hands in pockets, just maybe even look like they're waiting for something or just hanging out. Yeah, don't come and go, hey, man, what's, what, hey, guys, what's going on here? You hate that guy. That, hey, what's going on here? No, nothing. Nothing's going on here. Get out. That, th not that, for sure. Um, yeah, just, just match the energy in either group. Like I'm, a lot of this is like I'm trying to tell you how to be less creepy. Um, cause, no, no, cause, cause, cause we're passionate people and, and we're like, and when we're around people who are passionate about the same stuff that we're passionate about, we get weird cause we lose track of ourselves and we just get excited and we want to talk to everyone about it cause you know what I'm talking about. And, oh my God, we should be friends. Let's be friends. And we get creepy, especially to people who aren't that excited about the passion that exists anymore. <laughs> and don't want to talk to you. <laughs> like, you get creepy. Um, and so the concept of creepiness is huge in our industry. I'm sure we've all been creeped out by someone, uh, maybe even, even here in the last 24 hours. <coughs> and not, and again, not to disparage anyone in any way. Like, we all get creepy. I get creepy. I've creeped someone out in the last 24 hours, for sure. I was walking around with cat ears on all day. I'm sure you all saw that. Cat ears and a white jacket and... I like the white jacket. Jacket yeah, it was funny as guys always like the white jacket, you know, <laughs> girls. Like, <laughs> guys are always like, what's this made out of? <laughs> I was very tired. That was the best outfit I could throw together with how, like I said, I just came from St. Louis. This is my second con of the week. I've been talking for five days straight. These are all my badges I have to wear at this con. <laughs> um. Yeah, and, and I'll, I think I'll wrap it up on this because I was real excited. Um, the concept of creepiness, I was trying to nail it down to, and we're getting it real nerdy right now, I was trying to nail it down to what, like, what is creepiness? How do we define creepiness? Because cre everybody knows creepiness. Everybody's been creeped out. It's a universal experience. It is a universal thing that exists inside of us. So because it's universal, there has to be some way of, of making it a metric 
And if you can make it a metric, you can measure it, and then you can account for it, and you can adjust it. You can monitor and you can monitor and re react. Um, and so, what do we use for that sort of thing? Math and numbers. It's metrics. Um, I personally ended up using uh, a reverse trigonometric function because uh, I like math. And I worked with a really, really good friend who also works in InfoSec named Lindsay Spriggs, who uh, has, uh, I believe, a master's from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, she's a mathematician, loves math more than anyone I've ever met. And man, we sat down and we nerded it up on creepiness. And some of you may, may have seen a past form of this I'm about to throw up before. Um, but there was some extreme shit situations people would call me out on all the time. Every time I would throw this slide up, or somebody post this slide on Twitter, I'd get, I'd get hate mail back. Like, oh, but what about this? What about James Bond and poltergeists? Like, <laughs> like that. And I'd go, oh, all right, all right. So, and I'd try to like rationalize it. And I was like, I'm done with this. We're going to account for James Bond and poltergeists and how creepy and non-creepy they are. And, uh, and this was the end result. And it's legit. And it is the Johnny Xmas Grand Unified Creepiness Theory. And, I'll, and I know this doesn't make a lot of sense to most people, and I'll, and I'll make it make sense. Um, I'll run through it real quick. Awkwardness. How awkward you are? I'll get out of the way. You guys can take pictures. It's cool. Um, awkwardness. Uh, Forwardness amplifies your awkwardness, and awkwardness amplifies your forwardness. Those, those both increase your creepiness exponentially. Um, awkwardness just being like how awkwardly you, you, you approach it. Uh, say a question like, uh, hey, do you, excuse me, uh, do you, um, if it's okay, do you, um, do you mind? That's awkward. Forwardness is how, f uh, from the like 1920s, 30s, 40s speak, we used to use the forward, like, Fur, sir, how dare you be so forward with your questioning? Like when you would ask a, a question that's maybe not so socially acceptable. Um, uh, and then those two amp amplify your creepiness. Your attractiveness lowers that creepiness. You divide by your attractiveness. And it, and it lowers it to that level, to the point where you can actually divide by attractiveness. And that's an unfortunate truth. And so that's why appearance matters so much. That's why it matters, like, you know, wear a collared shirt, do your hair, et cetera. Like, dude, I, I, I know, I hate pants. Who like, anybody who like pants? Nobody likes wearing pants. But we all agree, like, we're going to wear pants when we go outside. You can't go outside without pants. Like, then, then society's all against you. I, uh, which is weird, because we all hate pants. But some guy's outside without pants, and you're by your window, like, dude, some guy out there with no pants on. What's he doing? Don't let the kids out. <laughs> All he's doing is what you want to do. But we, yeah, right. So then that's why you, we judge each other on appearance, and it sucks, and it's stupid, but that's what happens, and you have to just, until we as a society, society agree that, to stop doing that, which we can't because we're animals, and it's an animal thing, and it's just not going to happen. Um, that's what happens. And so, and then that's all... What's happening here is actually multiplication. It's all multiplied, multiplied exponentially by how persistent you are with whatever you're trying to push. How many times you just keep doing it. And the more you keep doing it, no matter how good this ratio is, no matter how close you are to like a one here, like totally not creepy at all, the more you persist, the more it's going to start getting creepy. Like if I ask you the same thing 20 times, it's going to get creepy. And so this applies to every social situation regardless of what's actually going on. Um, there was my notes on it. Yeah, you can take off. I know you're trying to, yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, because trigonometry, generally, we use it for graphing. And so here's the graph that that chart generates. This is a way better way of explaining what's going on. Um, like the you and me. Um, James Bond, I don't know if we have, no, it's not in this slide. Um, I had a separate one I was trying to cut down for time. James Bond is actually still an elliptical S curve. Um, he, he's just, he goes from one to like one and a half is what happens. But if you zoom in on James Bond, it's still that trigonometric function. Um, and and this, so these are all measurements of uh, creepiness um, based on, this is the, the result of that ratio. <laughs> 
Sounds really weird over here. Uh, the result of that top ratio, and this is your persistence. So as persistence increases based on what the results of that ratio was, here's, here's where you end up. Is how creepy you. And uh, uh, I found this one to be average, and I called it U. <laughs> and it's more to be funny. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so, like, pretty much, if you're five, fives across the board, you'll notice, like, what happens is you're generally... Not creepy if there's very very little persistence if you're if you're pretty average, um, it's a normal part of the day. Uh, as persistence increases, it's pretty steady, 45 degree angle, uh, and then um, it starts to level out as you get really persistent, um, but never really like caps out as like, whoa, this 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 guy's crazy creepy. Like it just it it, it hits annoying instead of creepy at that point and flattens out. It, you're right, it becomes annoying. Yeah, familiarity breeds annoyance. Uh, that's a whole different function. <laughs> this guy, Cletus, like, uh, we, I called him, uh, he, this guy was incredibly awkward, forward, and unattractive. Uh, and so you see what happens here. It's like, he, he, all, right off the bat, he's here. He's at this le this angle, and then like once he hits like a persistence of like three, we're done. We're done. I we how do we get out of here? We got to get out of here. It's getting crazy. <laughs> right, right. He's straight. Right, the, right off the, out of the gate. He's already he's already at a steep angle, and that's I called him Cletus after the Simpsons character, Cletus. So the real person you met. No, from The Simpsons. Okay. Yeah, no, because I was trying, like, all of the, my, my original one didn't have so much math, and it just accounted for these two, normal, uh, me, you and me, human beings. And then I would get tweet, tweets about, like, well, what about Cletus from The Simpsons? <laughs> well, okay, yeah, so, right. Uh, and so I, I, I made that, because they're like, what about people who are just creepy right out of the gate? Like, because, and so the other one, James Bond, was, um, was based on a Family Guy skit. Um, do you remember the... 50, 50, no, 50 no's and a yes means yes. Anybody? And it was a joke on how James Bond, like, um, especially in the older books, they're just James Bond by nature, the James Bond theme is a horribly sexist uh, character, and he, and he always gets the woman by just being, just being persistent and pushy on these women, and that's like the James Bond character. And so I, I made that one, and it still is an S curve, but like, he gets a little bit creepy. He gets a, he goes from like one to one and a half as persistence increases, but then it, like, it just, just mellows out, like, as long as he keeps trying, eventually he'll just wear them down and get that yes because they're just tired of him asking. But it's neither annoying nor creepy because he's so attractive. And he's so, and, and he's, yeah. And so that, that's, that's how creepiness works. <laughs> and I was super excited to have figured that out. And so um, we all get creepy. We all get passionate. And, and it's real, and, and we're all scared of strangers. Everyone's the same out there. So... Keep an eye on yourself, keep an eye on your body language, keep an eye on your energy levels, and you won't creep anyone out, and you'll make some friends, you'll get some business cards, and uh, you'll be pretty good to go. So I hope there's a lot here that's educational for you guys. Um, I hope I helped you guys out. I know you're not tourists. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Get an applause. <laughs> no, applause is awkward in a tiny room when there's only like ten of us. Do we do do we clap? Do, yeah. All right. Yeah. Go get some lunch. The what? No. Yes. Yeah. Um, that was actually. Recognize his name right off the bat. Uh, I did start my research at him. Okay. Yeah, he was an influence for the continuation of it. Really into it. Yeah, I, I would like to do that to the rest of the human persona. Or at least a paper. Well, not many people have done my research. Like right, that's a, it's a real, real comedy. Like Myers Briggs, and, and also a lot of psych psychologists to call bullshit on Myers Briggs. Yeah. Well, they call bullshit on the creepiness theory, too. Right? Yeah. So I call it a theory. Yeah. 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 yeah.
I'll just crowd around you and I'll really that's, no, that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> So I'd love to pick your brain at some point. So I'm in a weird situation where I actually like graduated high school in May. Right. So I am just now like getting started. Like I have four years of college probably even going to the field. Yeah. So, I um I was sure. fortunately exposed to Loki at a young age. Right. Yeah, I knew you were that guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it was funny, I could spot Loki in the across the room. I'd be like, he knows Loki. He's one of Loki's guys. Um yeah, um, what, what chat? I'm sure, there's probably a yeah, longer, awesome. longer chat you're looking for. I will make time for you. That would um, be awesome. I've got a lot to do today, uh, but you you might catch me by the CTF table working on Sugar Kyle. Yeah, and I'll and I'll. Cause I would love to sit down and chat. Yeah, yeah and I'll and I can in general can totally be like advice. I don't got time right now. Like yeah, just, uh, but are you playing the CTF? Yeah, well, we were in. Fourth place last time I checked. Yeah. 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 I'll give you. Did you do my challenge? Which was your? your I actually haven't started on those yet. My challenge is a picture of me, and you know it's mine. I looked at those. It didn't work, and then. If. If you put in the format. You're on the right track, and I know why it didn't work because it was the wrong answer. But you're on the right track because um, there's a false flag in there. That's what you want. Um, also, um, I'm really busy, so I like to block off my time with meetings. Yes. So is a clue. So <laughs> go work on that. Um, I'll be around. We will chat. I'll make, for I'll make, sure. If, I, I will make a point to make time for you at some point. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely so, like to talk a lot and stuff. Yeah. Okay. I was going to ask a similar thing. Like, can we sit down and talk to you about Oh, God, all of these books I forgot to get. Do you guys like books? I love yeah. books. I uh, Have you read How to Win Friends and Influence People? I've got, already got that. I'm sure you do. Uh, who's, who's the aspiring social engineer? Me. <laughs> <laughs> I got, I got several. Oh, I'll take that. Take that one. <laughs> Sweet. Thank you. you her, uh, she, she wants it first. Oh, she she no, I pull, you pull it. There. Yeah. That book. That book is one that changed my life. Um, the key to these. Do anybody want, how to win friends and Do you guys know what this is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a classic. It's a classic. What is it? It is self-explanatory. How to win friends and influence people. Um, it was written in like 1930. Uh, as a as a textbook for college students to teach them how to be salespeople, because a guy in Ivy League college um, was like, sales is huge, door to door sales back when that's how it worked. Um, but we have no course for salespeople. We have no means of teaching people how to be salespeople, even though it's a massive industry and needs people. Um, and so Dale Carnegie said, who was a massively successful salesperson said, I'll write you a textbook, and this is it. And it's, it is tons of stories. It says, here's, here's an, a, a type of person you may come across. Here's what, here's the type of personality you may have. Here's things they may say. Here's how you should not react. Here's how you should react. Here's how to get them back into a place where you can work with them. Uh, and then here's a story of a situation I came across or two. So you can see that in context, mm -hmm. uh, and it's great. And it's like how to contradict someone when you don't have any facts to back yourself up without making them angry. Mm -hmm. How to uh, deal with someone who's very opinionated on something that you are also very opinionated on the other end of wrong without making an enemy. Things like that, like intense, advanced social situations, all in here. And I love this book, and it's great. So if anybody's like super interested in that, I'll take it. I... All right. Okay. You still got a copy at home. Okay. Please. Anybody else have one? Have a copy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and you already have one. <laughs> what? Yeah, I don't know. So, I just didn't have one with me. So I'm kind of a book order. So back to the skill set. I'm yeah. leaving, Johnny. I just want to say thank you. Yeah, thanks so much we'll for coming. Next I knew time. you were coming. Yeah. <laughs> I got to go back home, so. Yeah, I hope it was, I hope it was useful. It was yeah, it was very useful. Like, I just want to say it was awesome. Cool. Yeah. Um, the one question I had about on skill sets, 
you do interviews, right? Oh. So you do power it. You interview people as they come in. Do you ask them for writing hey, samples? Hey, they don't anymore. Um, but I did the last one. Yeah. Okay. But do you like do you ask your the people coming in for writing samples? Because I've noticed that in a few jobs I've applied for, they all want to see a writing sample or a blog. No. No. Yeah. So that's just something I've run into. God, where? What uppity? This is uppity. That is. Who does? Who did that? Um, two big companies in Atlanta. <laughs> I really don't. That is someone anybody. who doesn't get what's going on. Was it? We're just about to go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we need. Oh, we have two minutes. Yeah. Um. Well, I'll just say goodbye. Well, I'm off. Yeah, it's clearly going to take me longer to walk across here than anybody else. <laughs>